On Friday, July 18th, 2008, shortly after 9 p.m., a single gunshot ripped through the bustling night near the Gwinnett Place Mall in Duluth, Georgia. A witness from the bus station across the street called 911 to report the shooting. No, I won. The lady just got shot. Is she breathing? Yeah, she, she moving a little. I've got everybody on the way. Paramedics and detectives from the Gwinnett County Sheriff's Office arrived at the scene and found an African-American woman lying on the ground with a single gunshot wound to the chest. She was stabilized and rushed to the hospital, where she later succumbed to her injuries. The victim was later identified as 40-year-old Janae Coleman. Investigators were left stumped with the lack of evidence at the scene. The investigation that followed was packed with twists that the detectives could never see coming. But was Janae murdered by someone she knew? And what could have been the reason behind it? Hello and welcome back to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from around the world. Today we dive into another disturbing case with an insane twist, the case of Janae Coleman. But before we delve any further, please take the time to show your support by subscribing to our channel, liking our videos, and clicking on that notification bell to receive the latest videos straight to your inbox. Without further delay, let's dive into another crime mystery. Duluth, Georgia is a small town with all the necessary big city amenities. Its 31,800 inhabitants get to enjoy a generous mix of modern living and outdoor activities. Named as the Tree City in 1989, Duluth is dedicated to maintaining its green spaces in an ever-expanding urban world. Its inexpensive cost of living attracts many families to its vibrant city. Its dense suburban feel also adds to the attraction. With the chance of falling victim to a violent crime being one in every thousand people, it's considered a fairly safe city to live as well. But it was here in 2008 that a horrific crime befell Janae Coleman. Janae Janie Coleman was born to parents Geraldine and Robert Coleman on October 2, 1967 in Elkhart, Indiana. She was the third of five siblings and had two sisters named Rhonda and Camelia and two brothers named Edwin and Vincent. She was raised in a family that prided themselves on honesty and love. Janae and her family were devout Christians who placed faith and family above all. Her parents eventually got divorced, but remained on friendly terms with each other. Apart from church, though, Janae saw serving her country as equally important. Once she turned 18, she enlisted with the military and served her country with honor. Once she completed her service, she returned home and dedicated herself to another passion, teaching. Her brother, Edwin Newsom, described her as being dedicated, passionate, and inspiring. She was a phenomenal teacher. Uh, I was actually in her class uh, a few years. Her ability was very awesome, awesome to see. Janae's love for children extended beyond the classroom. She opened both her home and heart to three adopted daughters, Lakashe, Felicia, and Adriana. Together they lived in Duluth, Georgia. At just 40 years old, Janae had bigger goals ahead. She was awarded certification that allowed her to open her very own preschool. But these dreams were shattered by a single gunshot. The sound of a single gunshot rang out at a busy intersection in Duluth, Georgia, just after 9 p.m. on Friday, July 18, 2008. Witnesses from the bus station across the road from the Gwinnett Place Mall watched as an African-American man pulled a woman from a car and dumped her on the ground before speeding off. One of the witnesses made a call to 911 as others tried to assist the woman. She was still breathing, but barely conscious. Paramedics arrived at the scene first and stabilized the woman. Detectives followed soon after and cordoned off the crime scene. A quick search of the immediate area and the victim yielded no identification and no one present at the scene recognized her. She was rushed to the Gwinnett Medical Center as investigators asked questions to those who witnessed the crime. From the bus driver, they learned that an African-American man had approached the woman who was seated in a gold-colored car. The bus driver said she watched as he placed his hand on the driver's door leaned in and began talking to the woman. She then heard a loud popping sound and watched as he pulled the victim from the car before dumping her on the pavement. He then drove off in her car. She provided detectives with one more vital detail. 
the man had been wearing a white t-shirt with green sleeves. Leading the investigation was Detective Damien Cruz from the Gwinnett County Police Department. As he walked around the scene looking for answers, he received some bad news. The victim had passed away during surgery. She was pronounced dead about 10 minutes into the uh, surgery. The suspected carjacking scenario had turned into a homicide. They needed to work fast if they wanted to find the killer. Looking around the area, Detective Cruz was surprised by the brazen behavior of the shooter. It was a fairly busy area, particularly with the bus station nearby. There's a mall maybe 300 feet away from there. There's a convenience store across the street. We're talking at a bus station, not just a stop. He sent his team of detectives to speak with managers at the nearby restaurants and convenience stores to ask them if they noticed a quarrel between a man and woman. He believed the shooting may have occurred after a fight between the two, and that could explain the motive. All queries came back without any new leads. No one had noticed the man or woman before the shooting took place. Six hours later, one of his questions was finally answered. While still at the crime scene, detectives received a report from the station. A woman named Camelia Coleman reported her sister Janae Coleman missing. She reported that her sister often waited near the Gwinnett Place Mall before going to pick up her eldest daughter from work. That night, however, she failed to pick up her daughter and hadn't returned home. She then went on to give a general description of Janae and the car she was driving. Detective Cruz knew immediately that Janae Coleman was their victim. Detective Cruz knew he needed to speak to Camelia face to face. He believed that speaking with her family might just bring them the answers they needed to solve the mystery of her murder. Detective Cruz paid Camelia a visit in the early morning hours of July 19, 2008. When the detective explained what had happened to Janae, Camelia shut down, unable to process the entire incident. I just never thought that we would not grow old together. She was only 40. 40 years old and she was already gone, so it was hard. After some time, she was able to calm down enough to answer the detective's questions. It baffled Camelia as to why someone would shoot her sister. She explained to detectives that Janae had no enemies or bad blood with anyone in the city. For Detective Cruz and his team, the investigation simply got more and more complicated. The crime scene was already devoid of any evidence and they had no idea where Janae's car was. The investigation team believed their best hope was to get hold of the car, and maybe evidence from there could lead them to the killer. Detective Cruz had already placed a trace on Janae's number plate, but nothing had come up. Just as he was about to lose all hope after questioning Camelia, he received some welcome news. Janae's gold Dodge Stratus was found 40 miles from the initial crime scene on July 19, 2008. An off-duty officer noticed the car parked in a dark shopping center. He then saw men walking away from the car and talking loudly on his cell phone. The officer told the man that he couldn't park in that spot. Distractedly, the man returned to the car and drove off. To the officer, the man's behavior seemed strange. It was what prompted him to run the license plate through the system and make the report. His behavior seemed strange to the officer, so the officer ran the tag. For Detective Cruz and his team, the officer's instincts had just paid off. Janae's car was again found just two miles away from where it was first located. It had been haphazardly parked, as if abandoned in a hurry. Now, Cruz hoped to find something of use in the car that could lead him towards the killer. The car was taken in for testing to the crime lab, and with help from the forensic team, they were able to find enough evidence to help solve the case. Well-preserved fingerprints were lifted from the exterior of the driver's side door. More fingerprints were found on the driver's door handle. Luck was on the side of the investigation team. In an act of providence, a cigarette butt was discovered inside the car under the driver's seat. In interviewing Janae's family, Detectives came to learn that she never smoked or allowed anyone to smoke in her car. They therefore knew the cigarette butt belonged to the killer. It was now up to the forensics team to extract enough DNA from the butt in order to create a profile and find the killer. It turned out that there was more than enough to begin testing, but the investigation was about to hit a snag with a DNA profile. After running the profile through the national database of the combined DNA index system, they didn't get any initial hits. When it was entered into CODIS, there was not an initial hit. The fingerprints were then used and run through the database, but once again, there were no positive leads on who the prints belonged to. Investigators were not ready to give up just yet. They had one more avenue to explore. Detective Cruz was able to get hold of CCTV footage from the stores located near the crime scene and the area where the car was eventually discovered. The video footage was about to unveil a most unexpected piece of evidence. 
they had actual footage of their killer. The CCTV footage from within a convenience store near where Janae was parked revealed a man wearing a white shirt with green sleeves, khaki pants, and carrying a black bag. This was the same shirt the bus driver described the shooter as wearing that night. It showed the man walking into the store two hours prior to the shooting. He was seen buying two cans of beer. Most notably, though, was another piece of evidence from the store's camera footage. Detectives watched as the man bought a pack of cigarettes. They were able to hear him ask the store clerk for a pack of Bronson Light Longs, the very same brand of cigarette butt found in Janae's car. The cigarette butt with the DNA from her vehicle was a Bronson Light 100, Bronson Light Long. He was also caught on camera in the same area where Janae's car was abandoned. For detectives, this was the ultimate evidence. They now had actual video of the man who had pulled the trigger and killed Janae with no remorse. Using this footage, investigators turned to the media and public to help in identifying the man caught on camera. A news special was broadcast throughout the Georgia area. The results were not what investigators expected. No one came forward with any tips regarding the man in the video footage. For once, investigators had everything they needed. Fingerprints, DNA evidence, eyewitnesses, and actual video footage of the man they believed was responsible for Janae's murder. Without a name or new leads, the man in the video had become a phantom. Janae's case was quickly turning cold, but Detective Cruz was determined to solve the case for the victim, Janae, and her family. Just over a year after Janae's murder, the CODIS system came back with a positive hit. It was a welcome result, despite how long it had taken. The DNA belonged to a man named Donald Eugene Smith, a 51-year-old man with a lengthy criminal record. His most recent arrest in the early 2000s had been drug-related. Investigators realized it was certainly possible that he could be responsible for the carjacking and murder. Looking at his picture, they saw that he bore a striking resemblance to the man on the CCTV footage. Investigators visited Janae's family and told them the name of the man and showed them his picture. No one had heard of Donald Smith or met him. They also said that Janae never mentioned anyone by that name. Investigators now knew the shooting was a random act of violence. A further look into his files revealed a cell phone number. Investigators turned to the cell phone company and were able to subpoena the cell phone records for the number. A cross-reference of the activity of the cell phone in relation to the cell towers and the location of the shooting and where Janae's car were found showed high activity from the mobile number. They also noted that the number was used on a job application made by Donald years earlier. Speaking with the manager of the company, he also confirmed that Donald was the same man in the photo and the video footage. This, together with the DNA evidence and video footage, was more than enough for detectives to make the arrest. On February 3, 2010, Donald Smith was arrested at a homeless shelter in Georgia. Detective Cruz immediately notified Janae's family, who were relieved to hear the news. We were relieved, very much relieved. It was the beginning of closure. Investigators prepared to sit down with Donald and get the answers they needed. The case, though, was about to take a very strange and unexpected twist. Investigators questioned Donald extensively about his involvement in the shooting of Janae Coleman. He denied having ever met her or stealing her car. Really, it's, it's about this vehicle, okay? I'm going to ask you questions. Have you ever seen this vehicle before or been in it? No, I have not. Have you ever met this woman before in your life? No, I haven't. Investigators then pushed for an explanation as to how his DNA was found in Janae's car if he wasn't the person who shot her. That vehicle you said you've never seen before? And the woman you've never seen before, yes. right? Your DNA ended up in that car. That's interesting because my DNA couldn't have been in that car because I've never been in that car. Donald was then shown video from the convenience store CCTV footage to which he denied ever being there. I have a, a picture basically on a computer I want you to look at. Let me know if you recognize the future self or not, okay? Sure. This is the day I'm talking about. Right. Oh, was it with this guy right here? Yeah. You're saying that's not me? That is definitely not me. I don't have a shirt like that. I don't have a dog. I probably can't even see the face of the person, but that's not me. He went on to say that it was hard to even recognize the face of the person. Donald also told police he did not own a shirt like that. When questioned about the phone number, Donald provided an explanation. 
And then your cell phone number at the time was 404-200. No, that was not mine. That was my brother's phone number. Investigators were getting nowhere with the questioning as Donald continued to deny his involvement. He was asked by detectives to take a polygraph test to determine if he was being truthful with his answers. The test results did not favor Donald. The results showed that he was being deceptive with his answers. When asked if he'd known Janae Coleman, his answer showed some level of truth. But when asked if he recognized the person in the video, it showed deception. In polygraph terms, he was being deceptive, and that's what they determined. There's certain important questions they asked. Do you know Janai Coleman? Did you shoot her? But they also asked, do you recognize the person on the video we've shown you? He failed it miserably. Following the polygraph test, Donald seemed shaken according to investigators. He was allowed to take a cigarette break. Detective Cruz decided to follow him to the break area and took note of the cigarette brand he smoked. What he saw created doubt in his mind. Donald smoked a brand of cigarettes called Aqua Blues that required being hand-rolled. They were not Bronson Light Longs. After the break, he returned to the room. Donald spoke calmly and explained a scientific theory that was about to blow the entire case wide open. DNA is split between T and twins. It's interesting, so they, they share DNA, identical right twins. Uh, I've never been in that car. Donald had a twin brother named Ronald, who he identified as the man in the video. He told the police to ask his parents and sister about who they believed was in the actual video. Detective Cruz was afraid this might happen. After reading Donald's file, he knew that Donald was one half of a set of twins. He was also aware that identical twins shared DNA. Their entire case hinged on whether they arrested the right twin. It was a scramble to reevaluate everything they knew about the case. Just as the case seemed to be falling apart at the seams, investigators remembered they had a final piece of scientific evidence, fingerprints. Although DNA is similar in identical twins, fingerprints are never the same in any two people. Identical twins may have the same DNA, but they do not have the same fingerprints. Nobody has the same fingerprints. Investigators tried to make contact with Ronald Smith, but he initially refused to voluntarily go down to the station for questioning. Once again, they turned to the cell phone network provider to find their suspect. He was discovered to be hiding out in his family home. His parents and sister were unaware of the crime he committed in 2008. Upon the request of Donald, investigators showed his family the CCTV footage. All three agreed that the person was in fact Ronald and not Donald, based on his walk and style of dressing. Ronald was arrested on February 5, 2010 and taken to the station where he was questioned about Janae Coleman and the evening of the shooting. Donald, however, had not been released as investigators did not want to take any chances in case they were playing a game. Several things had somehow started to paint a clearer picture. The cell phone used by Ronald was the very same used by the killer at both crime scenes. The cigarettes that Ronald smoked were the same found in Janae's car. And finally, the fingerprints found on the car were a perfect match to Ronald Smith. Ronald Smith's print matches the print that was recovered from the car. Now, all they needed was a confession. First, detectives began by presenting the evidence they had on Ronald. This is it. After we conclude here in the next few minutes, you'll be taken over to the county jail. And the next time that you see Detective Cruz will be in the preliminary here. He will present everything he has on the case, which is overwhelming. I mean, video, DNA, prints, phone records. When that didn't work, they tried the emotional approach and asked him why he'd shot Janae Coleman. This is the woman, okay? Her name was Janai. okay? She had three adopted children. She was a school teacher. Her family, uh, they're very religious people. And they just, they weren't even, they were more just wanted to know why than anger. And I promised them I would at least ask. Okay. Ronald became visibly upset and started to feel overwhelmed. He asked for a break. Like all of a sudden. This is like all of a sudden on me. And I, I, I want to say something. Can I use the bathroom? Okay. 
my one cigarette. Okay. And um, come back and talk. He was left alone with Shanae's photo in the interrogation room as detectives watched him from the other side of the one-way mirror. Detective Cruz said in interviews afterward that Ronald began to look at Janae's photo and apologize for what he'd done. After the break, detectives returned and turned the camera away from Ronald to ease the pressure on him. He then made a candid confession. Guilty. I don't know why. It was an accident. It was a hair trigger. I said I would take a car. So I had done before when I was way younger. At gunpoint. At gunpoint. She said he shot me. This is my auto revolver. It was a 357. It was five shots. And then I went to something before I ended up doing something stupid again. I took the car down to uh the forest park. Park there. No. You know, her family, this was something they really wanted to know as far as closure, okay? You can tell them that taking someone's life was not in the mix of it. It was no part of the picture. You can tell them it was a strange accident. Well, thank you. I know that was difficult for you, but I thank you. Ronald was arrested for Janae Coleman's murder on February 6, 2010. He was detained at the Gwinnett County Jail without bond. I mean, wow. What a relief it was that they finally caught him. Investigators were able to gather more evidence of a confession when he made a call to a childhood friend from within the jail. On the call, which was recorded, Ronald told the childhood friend, among other things, that someone had died about a year and a half ago at his hands. Although the call could not be used as evidence, for investigators, it gave them hope that they finally caught their killer. His twin brother Donald was released and allowed to return to his family without any charges. With Ronald's confession, detectives and prosecutors had everything they needed to move forward with the case. They worked hard to prepare an airtight argument that would ensure Janae's killer went away for a very long time. Jury selection for the trial took place on Monday, October 22, 2012, with Ronald's trial beginning that same week. The family of both the victim, Janae, and the suspect, Ronald, were in attendance. The jury heard testimony from experts and the theories based on what investigators found at the crime scene and in the car. Donald, Ronald's twin brother, was also called to testify, and he explained the confusion called by the evidence that led to his initial arrest for the crime. He then swore that he was not the person responsible for killing Janae Coleman. Ronald was about to add another twist to the case. He saw this as an opportunity to turn the case in his favor. Ronald reversed his confession and placed all the blame on his twin, Donald. He alleged that his brother committed the crime. That was like the monkey wrench that was thrown into the whole case. How are they gonna prove that one brother didn't do it over the other brother? What's gonna happen and how is this gonna play out? When experts explained that the fingerprints did not lie, Ronald said that his fingerprints were on the car because he helped wipe the car clean but forgot to remove his prints from the driver's door. On Friday, October 26, 2012, the jury deliberated for two hours before returning to court with a decision. They found Ronald Smith guilty of carjacking and the murder of Janae Coleman. His brother, Donald Smith, was cleared of all suspicion. Ronald was sentenced to life plus 25 years in prison by Superior Court Judge Melody Snell Connor. To this day, he remains incarcerated at the Wheeler Correctional Facility in Alamo, Georgia. After the trial, Janae's family were able to find some closure after her tragic death at the hands of Ronald Smith. Her sister, Camelia Coleman, spoke to reporters after the sentencing and told them that the family's faith never waned as they knew the justice system would work. We prayed for a quick resolve and swift justice, and we've seen that happen, she said. Rather than focusing on hatred and revenge, Janae's family decided to honor her by fulfilling her lifelong dream. On July 13, 2015, the Janae Coleman Excellence Academy opened its doors to more than 100 children in Elkhart, Indiana, just days before the seventh anniversary of her death. She is still building dreams, building hopes. Janae, your dreams living on. For her mother, Geraldine Brown, it was both a moment of pain and pride. In an interview, she said that she felt pride at finally realizing Janae's dream despite the pain, and being able to honor Janae this way was ultimately the goal. 
because of what she stood for. She stood for what was right. She stood for encouragement and improvement in the lives of, of young people. Geraldine described the school as being a legacy of love, and it was a way Janae was still accomplishing her dreams by building hope for the children in their community. Had it not been for the fingerprints found on the car door, there was a strong possibility that the wrong man could have been convicted for a crime he never committed. Her life was stolen. Her life was stolen. And in such a horrible way. I made a promise to her at her grave that I would see that justice was done. I didn't really know how I would carry out that promise, but that's the last thing I could do for her. It was a warm Thursday afternoon on May 31st, 1984, when a farmer made a gruesome discovery in his field near a quarry in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Police arrived at the scene and found the body of 18-year-old Laura Salmon. The ruthless manner of the young woman's death sent shockwaves through the community. Despite a wealth of circumstantial evidence and a number of possible suspects, the case eventually went cold. It would take another 16 years before DNA testing provided investigators with enough evidence to finally nab her killer. Was Laura murdered by a random killer? Or was this the work of someone she knew personally? The city of Murfreesboro in Tennessee once served as the state capital for eight years until that title was awarded to Nashville in 1826. Today, with a population of 153,000 residents, it remains the county seat of Rutherford County and the largest suburb of Nashville, Tennessee. It's an agricultural town with some of its main exports being corn, cotton, and tobacco. Murfreesboro is also known for its high-performing academic institutions, most notably Middle Tennessee State University, or MTSU. When it comes to crime, Murfreesboro's violent crime rates rank lower than the national average, and its property crime rates are on par with cities of its size. As one of Tennessee's fastest-growing cities, it still remains a place where many have chosen to call home and raise a family in. In 1984, Laura Salmon was a freshman in Middle Tennessee State University in Murfreesboro when she met a tragic end. Born on October 6, 1965, Laura Lee Salmon was the only child of Laureen and John Salmon. Even as a child, Laura was so charming and popular that she was crowned Little Miss Murfreesboro in preschool. As she grew up, she was often described as the girl next door. During the summers, she participated in various theater productions hosted by the Murfreesboro Little Theater. Laura's parents divorced when she was quite young, but they remained on friendly terms with each other and co-parented their daughter. Laura excelled academically and graduated with honors from Oakland High School in 1983. She was also a member of the Flag Corps while in high school. In the fall of 1983, she started attending Middle Tennessee State University. At the same time, Lori began working at the Kroger grocery store in Murfreesboro with her childhood friend, Trina Daniel. Laura was also in a relationship with high school senior Kyle Gilley, whom she'd met in 1982. Though he was a year younger than Laura, the couple maintained their relationship even after she graduated from high school. Like any young woman her age, Laura was enjoying her time in college surrounded by friends and making plans for an exciting future. Unfortunately, all the promise and potential of her life was soon cut short by a ruthless killer. On the afternoon of Thursday, May 31st, 1984, local farmer Johnny Muckle was walking around his farm when he noticed a pile of clothes in one of his fields. Upon further inspection, he realized it was the body of a young woman. Immediately, he drove down to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office to report the gruesome discovery. Officers, led by Detective Robert Ashbury, followed Muckle back to his farm and found a young woman lying on her back in the field exactly as described. It was obvious to officers that she was deceased. She'd been covered up by two pairs of jeans, one a woman's Sergio Valente and the other a man's wrestler jeans. A sleeve of a black members-only jacket was tied around her neck. In her right hand, she clutched a pair of underwear which officers guessed were her own. The only item of clothing she had on was a bra. The left side of her head showed visible signs of trauma, and several blood-stained rocks were scattered haphazardly near the body. Officers deduced that her attacker had beaten her with the same rocks. The area where the body was discovered was familiar to officers. 
It was often used by local high school and college students as a venue for parties and bonfires. It was also a well-known lover's lane for young couples. The young woman in the field was also familiar to many of the officers at the crime scene. She was a friendly blonde cashier from the local Kroger grocery store, Laura Salmon. Laura's body was taken to the Rutherford County Mortuary to await an autopsy. Meanwhile, officers visited Laura's parents, Laureen and John, separately. At the time of her murder, Laura had just moved in with her father and stepmother, Brenda. Laura's mother, Laureen, was devastated by the news, but she immediately pointed the finger at Laura's boyfriend, 17-year-old Kyle Gilly. Laureen, who was an English teacher at Oakland's high school that Kyle attended, had heard rumors of his behavior that made her uneasy. She went on to tell officers that Laura and Kyle had a toxic relationship. Kyle was known to be possessive and jealous and often treated Laura badly. Laureen told officers that she never approved of the couple's relationship and had told her daughter to end things with Kyle. It had come to a point where Laura had constantly stressed out about her relationship. Laureen and several family members had urged Laura to take out a restraining order against Kyle after he'd started to become violent with her. Laureen had gone as far as to forbid Kyle from coming to their house while Laura lived with her. Officers were starting to suspect Kyle Gilly based on Laureen's concerns, but it didn't prove that he was the killer. They needed to find out more. Next, officers visited Laura's father John and his wife Brenda. Both John and Brenda said they'd last seen Laura on the morning of May 31, 1984. She'd gone out the previous night with a friend Trina Daniel, and both girls had ended up sleeping in the family den. Nothing had seemed off when Laura got ready and left with Trina on the morning of May 31st for her 9 a.m. shift at Kroger's. Following these interviews, Laura's boyfriend, Kyle Gilly, arrived at the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office in the evening. Kyle told officers he'd called Laura's father, who said he needed to go down to the Sheriff's Office to give a statement about Laura. He spoke to Deputy Chief Robert Asbury, who informed Kyle of Laura's murder. Kyle told Asbury that he last saw Laura on Wednesday, May 30th, 1984, at her grandmother's house. They'd been together from 6.30 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. They'd made some plans to go swimming the next afternoon at her grandmother's house, but he said she never showed up. It was only after he called her father that he figured out something was wrong. Deputy Asbury didn't take down a formal statement from Kyle as he was underage and allowed him to leave. While officers worked on questioning Laura's family about her movements up until her death, Sergeant Ralph Hugh had a hunch. He knew Laura worked at Kroger's and that no one had been able to locate her car yet. He was on patrol duty the night that Laura's body was discovered and decided to drive by the Kroger store on Tennessee Boulevard. His hunch paid off. At 12.40 a.m. on June 1, 1984, he found a two-toned beige 1976 Oldsmobile Cutlass Salon in the Kroger parking lot. It was Laura's car. The car, along with soil samples and the evidence discovered at the crime scene, was sent to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, or TBI, for testing. As investigators waited for the results, they worked on building a timeline of events leading to Laura's murder. They visited the Kroger store to speak with Trina Daniels, Laura's best friend. Trina told officers that Laura had picked her up from work at 11 p.m. on Wednesday, May 30, 1984. They then went to a nightclub in Nashville and returned to Laura's father's house at around 3.30 a.m. The next morning, on May 31st, Trina had taken a lift with Laura to the store. While Laura began her shift at 9 a.m., Trina had made her way to her own home because she was working a later shift. Trina told officers that when she arrived at work shortly after 1 p.m. that day, she didn't see Laura's car at the usual spot. However, sometime between 3 p.m. and 3.30 p.m., while helping a customer carry out groceries, she'd seen Laura's car parked in a different spot. Investigators then questioned Sybil Waite, who was Laura's supervisor, and Sharon Falk, who had worked the morning shift with Laura the day she died. Both women confirmed that Laura had left early to go swimming at her grandmother's house. During the course of these interviews, more details emerged about Laura and Kyle's troubled relationship. Sharon told investigators that she'd once advised Laura to seek help after noticing black and blue bruising on her face. Trina added that Laura had confided in her about dating other men while at university and begged her to keep it a secret. Laura was afraid of Kyle's reaction if he found out. This information added a new surprise and shocking complication to the investigation. Although Kyle seemed like the most likely suspect, the fact that Laura was dating freely meant that anyone could be a suspect at this point. 
On June 2, 1984, Tennessee State Medical Examiner Dr. Charles Harlan performed Laura's autopsy. In his report, he determined that Laura had died due to blunt force trauma to her head, possibly caused by a heavy rock. She'd received a total of 10 blows to different parts of her head, resulting in a spiderweb pattern of skull fractures, as cold case detective Dan Goodwin explained in a television interview. Her left eye had also been discolored, which Dr. Harlan determined was the result of a fist to her face. Dr. Harlan also examined Laura for signs of assault. He deduced that Laura had been intimate with a partner 24 to 48 hours prior to her death. The act was determined to be consensual and not forced, as pointed out by the District Attorney General in a televised documentary. Interestingly enough, the biological sample taken from Laura did not match with the sample found on the men's rustler's genes from the crime scene. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation partnered with the Federal Bureau of Investigation to test Laura's car. There were no fingerprints in the car, not even Laura's. This led investigators to believe that the killer had wiped down the vehicle carefully. What they did find was a single foreign hair that they kept for testing. Through microscopic analysis, the dirt found on the mats inside the car and the fender matched the mud on the road located near the crime scene. On Monday, June 4, 1984, Laura was laid to rest at the Coleman Cemetery in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. The funeral was attended by close friends and family who paid tribute to the bubbly young woman they remembered. Also present at the funeral was Laura's close friend from university, Dan Goodwin, who'd been to the movies with Laura just four days before her death. Goodwin promised Laura's mother, Laureen, that he would find her killer no matter how long it took. Laureen, too, made that promise to her deceased daughter. I made a promise to her at her grave that I would see that justice was done. I didn't really know how I would carry out that promise, but that's the last thing I could do for her. Investigators worked through their notes they'd collected over the course of several interviews with Laura's family members and friends. By this time, investigators felt strongly that Kyle might know more than he was telling them. On June 6, 1984, 17-year-old Kyle was summoned to the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office for an interview. Kyle, being underage, was accompanied by a stepfather during the questioning. Kyle was read his Miranda rights before investigators took a formal statement from him. He told investigators that he'd met Laura at around 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, May 30, 1984, at her grandmother's house. At around 9 p.m., the two of them had left in his car and driven to Belmwood Church in Murfreesboro. Kyle explained that he parked his car behind the church before being intimate with Laura. Afterwards, he dropped her back at her grandmother's house. Kyle told investigators that he drove off to work a night shift and assumed Laura had driven back to her father's house. He returned from work at around 7 a.m. on May 31st and went to sleep. Kyle told detectives he didn't wake up until 3 or 4 p.m. His statement was backed up by Kyle's stepfather, who told investigators that he'd seen Kyle sleeping when he came home from work around 3 p.m. The stepfather added that the only time Kyle left home was when Laura's father, John Salmon, told him something had happened to Laura and he needed to go to the sheriff's office. Investigators were still suspicious of Kyle because he was the only one with a strong motive. But so far, his story and alibi had checked out. A month later, in July 1984, TBI agent Tom Carmouche decided to interview Kyle again. Kyle told agent Carmouche that he'd been to Florida until May 29, 1984. He then repeated the story he told investigators during his June interview. This time, however, he added a new detail. He told Carmouche that after he and Laura had been intimate, they cleaned themselves up using an old pair of his jeans. Yet Kyle denied being involved in Laura's murder, and his stepfather's alibi helped solidify his claims. Without enough evidence to link Kyle to the murder, he was released, much to the disappointment of Laura's mother, Laureen. But investigators were about to find another lead in the case. While putting together a timeline of Laura's movements, investigators received a call from a woman in Nashville, Tennessee. The woman, who wanted to remain anonymous, alleged that she'd been assaulted by a man named John Taylor. The woman claimed that Taylor had threatened that if she didn't keep quiet, he'd do the same thing to her as he'd done to Laura Salmon. This unexpected lead turned the investigation in a different direction. Investigators ran a background check on John Taylor and discovered some interesting information. He attended Middle Tennessee State University and was a member of the same gym as Laura. Taylor also frequented the same fraternity parties Laura attended. 
Investigators then questioned people who knew Taylor and discovered that he had a history of violence against former girlfriends. They also learned that Taylor was seen near the MTSU campus on the day Laura was murdered. Taylor was called in for questioning by investigators, but he denied assaulting the woman from Nashville. He also denied being involved in Laura's murder or having mentioned the incident to anyone. To rule him out as the suspect, Taylor was asked to submit a hair sample to compare against the strand found in Laura's car. FBI forensic chemist Patty Chowater compared the samples. Although both hair strands were consistent, DNA testing of hair was still years away from making a definitive match. Investigators could not charge Taylor without strong evidence. The next step was to compare the man's genes found at the crime scene with the genes used by Taylor. The genes retrieved from the crime scene had a waist size of 30 inches and an inseam of 36 inches, but these measurements were way too long for Taylor to use on a daily basis. With no strong evidence, investigators released Taylor and ruled him out as a suspect in Laura's murder. Over 100 men were interviewed in the course of the investigation that year, but all were cleared after their alibis checked out. Whoever killed Laura Salmon seemed to have simply vanished into thin air. With no new leads, Laura's case started to grow cold by the end of 1985. However, years later, when new investigators looked over the cold case files, several issues started to emerge. The new investigators discovered that the crime scene had not been properly secured and that evidence had been handled without the use of gloves. It was noted that John Salmon, Laura's father, was the person who found her necklace at the crime scene and discovered more rocks covered in blood. He'd handed these items to investigators, possibly compromising the evidence due to faulty handling. It was also noted that officers had never taken a formal statement from Johnny Muckle, the farmer who discovered Laura's body. No explanation was ever given for the lack of proper police work. It was the year 2000 that Laura's case started to heat up again. Laura's friend Dan Goodwin, who'd promised Laura's mother that he'd find her killer, was about to come through with his pledge. He'd taken a much longer route than expected. The first cold case Goodwin received was Laura's, and for this he was partnered with Sergeant Bill Sharp. Their first task was to send all the evidence from the case to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation for DNA testing. In addition to Laura's DNA, two unknown DNA profiles were recovered from the men's rustler's genes and from Laura's clothes. This time around, forensic testing had advanced to the point where DNA profiles from the crime scene could be compared with samples to identify the owner. At the same time, detectives were about to stumble upon another unexpected piece of information. They received another interesting tip. A 16-year-old student from Oakland High School had reportedly claimed that his father was the man who'd murdered Laura Salmon. Armed with the DNA profiles, Goodwin and Sharp got to work quickly. The detectives discovered that the boy's father had a criminal record for aggravated assault. They were able to track down their suspect, a man named David Patterson. But by the time they heard of the rumor, Patterson had been shot and killed in an unrelated incident. Instead, the detectives turned to Patterson's children and asked them to submit DNA samples for testing. In the end, their DNA did not match any of the samples extracted from Laura's body or the men's genes. This ruled out Patterson. Investigators started looking through the case files and the original suspect list. They contacted John Taylor, one of the earlier suspects, who volunteered his DNA for testing. His DNA didn't match any of the samples from the crime scene. In order to ensure transparent police procedure, Detective Dan Goodwin also submitted a DNA sample, as he too had gone on a date with Laura just days before her murder. He was cleared of any suspicion in the murder. But there was still one suspect that investigators were keen on looking up. That was Kyle Gilly. Goodwin and Sharp received Laura's case file looking for any information that may have been overlooked by other investigators. It was at that moment a truly unbelievable piece of evidence came to their notice. They found a curious note about a possible witness who contradicted Kyle Gilly's alibi. Goodwin and Sharp tracked down the witness, Gladys Mears, who still lived in Murfreesboro. Their interview with Gladys was about to blow their cold case wide open. Gladys told investigators that while driving home on the afternoon of Laura's murder, she'd seen a two-toned beige Oldsmobile Cutlass at the intersection of Twin Oak and Halls Pike. She remembered the car was on the road that led away from the quarry where Laura's body was eventually discovered. She recalled waiting for the car to move first, but the driver was just sitting there. She eventually cut ahead and proceeded through the intersection, 
but managed to get a good look at the driver of the Oldsmobile. The next day, she learned about Laura's mother through news articles and television reports. Gladys told several co-workers about what she'd seen the previous afternoon. They advised her to speak to investigators. She then visited the Rutherford County Sheriff's Office and informed officers that she'd seen the young man from the newspaper driving the victim's car the same afternoon of the murder. Gladys told Goodwin and Sharp that a few months later, she'd been interviewed again by Agent Carmouche, who provided her with a photo lineup. She'd picked out Kyle Gilly instantly. According to Gladys, it was the driver's behavior that made an impression on her. He appeared to be staring straight ahead with a blank expression on his face. Armed with this new information that had somehow got lost among the pages of the case file, Goodwin and Sharp started building a profile of Kyle Gilly. They re-interviewed old witnesses and discovered some new ones as their investigation progressed. Some witnesses said that Kyle had stalked Laura around the MTSU campus and even physically assaulted her in the dormitory. The detectives also learned that Kyle had exhibited strange behavior after Laura's death. A new witness, Shelley Davenport, told investigators that when she ignored Kyle's advances, he'd asked her if she wanted to end up like Laura. When she asked who Laura was, he'd openly told her that she was his ex-girlfriend and that he'd killed her. He would get mad at her, grab her by the head, and start banging her head into cars, school lockers, whatever was at hand. He would punch her. On one occasion, he broke out both of her front teeth. Forensic analysts at the TBI Crime Laboratory also worked hard to find enough evidence that could prove the person wearing the rustler jeans was the person who had attacked and killed Laura. The blood on the jeans was tested against Laura's DNA and came back as a positive match. The pattern of blood splatter also indicated that whomever attacked Laura had been wearing the jeans and kneeling next to her at the time of the crime. It also indicated that a blunt instrument like a rock was likely used because the blows had not generated much force. All analysts needed now was to find a match to the biological material found on the jeans. Goodwin and Sharp focused on tracking down Kyle, who had relocated to Florida in 1986. On May 9, 2000, the detectives made contact with Sergeant Rich Gherkin at the Manatee County Sheriff's Office in Florida. Gherkin reviewed the background information on Laura's case before calling Kyle in for an interview. Once again, Kyle denied having anything to do with Laura's murder and even denied being intimate with her before her death. Kyle was served a warrant for his blood sample, which was sent off to the TBI forensic lab for testing. On May 31st, 2000, the 16th anniversary of Laura Salmon's death, the DNA sample of Kyle Gilly positively matched the biological sample found on the rustler genes at the crime scene. It linked Kyle to the crime scene and proved that he was most likely the person who had killed Laura. On November 13, 2001, Dan Goodwin flew to Florida to interview Kyle. From the outset, Kyle denied being violent to Laura or visiting her on the MTSU campus. He only admitted that the rustler genes may have been his. Goodwin knew Kyle was lying about everything. Goodwin himself had seen Kyle several times on campus with Laura. He was able to get on record all the denials made by Kyle during their interview. When Goodwin told Kyle that he had an expert who could testify that Laura's killer had been wearing the very same pair of rustler jeans, Kyle asked for an attorney, which subsequently ended the interview. Finally, on November 14, 2001, Kyle Gilly was arrested for the murder of Laura Salmon. Because Kyle had been under the age of 18 at the time of Laura's murder, he was arraigned in juvenile court instead of a criminal court. A hearing was held in 2002 to determine whether his case should be transferred to the adult circuit court. On February 1, 2002, following several witness statements regarding the violent relationship between Laura and Kyle, juvenile court judge Donna Scott ruled that Kyle would be indicted as an adult. On March 6, 2002, a grand jury indicted Kyle of first-degree murder charges. It would take another four years for Kyle's trial to begin, as prosecution and defense attorneys argued back and forth over which witness testimony should be allowed in the final hearing. On July 26, 2006, Kyle Gilley's trial for the murder of Laura Salmon began in the Tennessee Court of Criminal Appeals. I'm telling you today that I am a mother who keeps her promises. I told them why I thought it was him or why I knew it was him. And I was very frustrated that they didn't take that seriously.
the prosecution provided witness statements that proved Kyle had exhibited violent behavior towards Laura and often threatened her life. They also used forensic evidence and eyewitness statements to prove that Kyle had been present at the crime scene. According to the prosecution, Kyle had likely attacked Laura in a fit of rage and jealousy when she tried to end their relationship. Kyle's defense, however, tried to dispel their theories by stating that another unknown male DNA sample had been found on the victim. His defense team also highlighted the alibi provided by a stepfather, who had seen Kyle sleeping at home on the afternoon of Laura's murder. This alibi was backed up by Kyle's stepbrother, Michael Powell, who said he'd also seen Kyle sleeping in their home at the time of Laura's murder. But when Michael was cross-examined by prosecutors, it emerged that he'd written a letter to Kyle in prison. Michael admitted that in the letter, he promised Kyle he'd provide him with an alibi at the trial. In September 2006, Kyle Gilley was found guilty of first-degree murder. According to the 1984 state sentencing laws, Kyle was sentenced to 30 years in prison. In 2008, Kyle appealed his conviction to the Court of Criminal Appeals. The court, however, upheld his original conviction. He'll be eligible for parole on September 25, 2042. It took over 20 years for Laura Salmon's family to finally see justice served on her behalf. When Kyle Gilley is eligible for his first parole hearing in September of 2042, I'll be 83 years old. But if I'm alive, and if my partner Bill Sharp's alive, we'll be there to testify against releasing him. It took smart investigative work and technological advancements to piece together the puzzle that had plagued Rutherford County investigators for decades. How did the initial investigators not see through the lies of Kyle Gilley from the outset? And why did they ignore a witness statement that contradicted Kyle's alibi from way back in 1984? There was a small child of two or three years old who was pulling at the arm of his mother who was lying covered with blood on the ground. I heard the child shouting, get up, mummy, get up. On the pleasant summer morning of July 15th, 1992, a passerby came across a horrific sight in Wimbledon Common, southwest London. 23-year-old Rachel Nickell was lying soaked in blood underneath a silver birch tree. Clinging to her side, her two-year-old son was desperately pleading for her to wake up. The incident sent shockwaves through the country, leaving the community in fear and law enforcement with the daunting task of finding the perpetrator responsible for this atrocious act. But as the investigation progressed, mind-boggling twists unfolded, taking everyone by surprise. With the investigation still underway, two compelling questions emerged. Who could harbor such deep-seated animosity towards this innocent woman? Would the child's eyewitness account provide crucial evidence to bring the culprit to justice? Or would the trauma impede his ability to recall crucial details? Wimbledon, London, a place that captures the heart with its timeless charm. Nestled in the southwest of the bustling city, this enchanting district is known worldwide for its prestigious tennis tournament, but it offers so much more. As you wander through Wimbledon, you'll find an irresistible blend of history and modernity. With an array of Victorian-style houses, the streets are also lined with charming boutiques, quaint cafes, and independent shops, each with its unique character. The soul of Wimbledon, however, can be found in its lush open spaces, where nature and urban life harmoniously coexist. It was a neighborhood that embraced tradition and offered respite from the fast-paced world, reminding people to appreciate the simple joys of life. However, this place also carries a haunting chapter in its history, forever linked with the tragic 1992 murder of Rachel Nickell, an event that left an indelible mark on this otherwise peaceful neighborhood. Rachel Jane Nickell was born on November 23, 1968, to her army officer father, Andrew Nickell, and her mother, Monica, in Great Totham, a village near Colchester in Essex, England. She possessed a naturally charitable spirit from a young age, displaying a genuine desire to assist the elderly and disabled children in her community. While attending Colchester High School for Girls, Rachel excelled in her studies. But she also shared a passion for dancing, singing, and acting. So to hone her skills, at the young age of 11, she joined the Essex Dance Theatre. While she had the potential to pursue a career in the arts, 
she ultimately made the decision to study history in English and earned a degree. However, she still had aspirations to become a model someday. In 1988, Rachel secured a job as a lifeguard at a Richmond swimming pool, and it was there that she crossed paths with Andre Henscomb, a young motorcycle courier. The two quickly fell in love, and the following year, Rachel gave birth to their son, Alexander Lewis. Although the couple wasn't married, they were living together as a family. Off to a fresh start, the couple moved to the Balham area of South London with their infant son. While Andre worked hard to provide for the family, Rachel stayed home. She devoted herself to being a full-time mother, even though she'd been offered work as a photographic model. By July 1992, Rachel's life seemed to be on a positive trajectory. She eagerly anticipated the approaching milestone of her son Alex's third birthday, which was just a month away. She went about her days, oblivious to the harrowing fate that soon lay in store for her. On July 15, 1992, the residents of South London awoke to a warm and promising Wednesday morning. For Rachel Nickel, it was no different either. She decided to go for a walk with her son Alex and her dog Molly, which she did on a regular basis. Her go-to spot was Wimbledon Common, a vast 1,100-acre stretch of countryside which was used as a public park. The common played host to a myriad of activities, including cricket, rugby, golf, horseback riding, jogging, and dog walking. No wonder, even on that particular day, it drew a crowd of more than 500 people. Although it was three miles away from her home, Rachel found this spot safer than the parks nearer her home. Rachel arrived at the Wimbledon Common Car Park at 9.45 a.m. that morning. After parking her car, she walked by the mound on a path frequented by her, unaware of the evil that was waiting just around the corner. At around 10.35 a.m., Michael Murray, a retired architect, was walking his dog along the same path when he made a chilling discovery. We came up this path and uh, I saw what I thought to someone sunbathing, I saw the bare leg. But as we got closer, I realized that this was something quite, uh, quite different and horribly tragic. There, drenched in a pool of blood, lay the lifeless body of 23-year-old Rachel Nickel. Also soaked in his mother's blood, a hysterical Alex was begging his mother to wake up, clinging to her arms. There was a small child, about two or three years old, who was pulling at the arm of his mother, who was lying covered with blood on the ground. I heard the child shouting, get up, mummy, get up. Deeply shaken by the heartbreaking sight before him, Murray called the police. Upon receiving the distressing call, the police swiftly sprang into action and cordoned off the area. One of the first officers to reach the scene was Chief Inspector Mick Wickerson, and the scene was nothing less than traumatic for him either. And I can honestly tell you that this is the most horrendous and vicious attack that I've ever seen. From the outset, it was evident that the attack was frenzied. Rachel was stabbed to death with such a force that every single one of her vital organs had been damaged. She received a total of 49 stab wounds. Some of those wounds were to her back and chest areas, but a few wounds on her hands suggested that she'd valiantly fought for her life before being tragically overpowered by her assailant. The slash to her neck was so violent that it had almost decapitated her. Some injuries were inflicted after death as a tormenting proof that the attacks did not stop even at her death. Her pants were pulled down from the waist, which hinted at the horrid possibility of assault. Alex was examined at the scene as Rachel's body was sent to the medical examiner's office. He had abrasions on his face that were consistent with being dragged along the ground while face down. But amidst this harrowing tragedy, authorities were facing a formidable challenge to contain a crime scene of over a thousand acres and with potentially 500 witnesses. The crowd was allowed to depart after the police took their statements. Sadly, no one had heard Rachel's screams or witnessed the crime. Officers were hoping that the killer would have left some DNA evidence behind, but unfortunately, forensics did not find any foreign DNA at the crime scene. However, minute flecks of red paint had been combed from Alex's hair, which was then preserved as evidence. When Rachel's boyfriend, Andre Hanscom, received the devastating news of her untimely death, his world was shattered. Despite his own grief, his fatherly instinct kicked in and he knew that he had to be strong for his child. The boy was, however, in much worse condition, 
having witnessed his mother's death in front of his own eyes. In 90s London, it was the rarest of the rare incidences of such an attack taking place in broad daylight. So the news quickly spread, dominating headlines across the city. The incident left the community in a state of profound disbelief and horror. In the midst of all this, Andre made a heartfelt plea to the public to come forward with any information they had regarding the killer. I would say to anybody who does know this person, no matter how they feel about them, please come forward before he destroys anybody else's life. Rachel's parents, Andrew and Monica, were vacationing in Canada when the tragic incident unfolded. It took four agonizing days for the heartbreaking truth to reach them. They knew they'd lost their daughter forever, and all they wanted was to know who was capable of committing such a cruel act. She can never be replaced in our lives. We can only try and slowly pick up the pieces, but our lives will always be less rich than when she was alive. The Metropolitan Police of London, on the other hand, were facing an appalling situation where they had neither any forensic evidence nor an eyewitness account. With this challenging scenario, the pressing question weighing on their minds was, where would they begin? The appalling situation, we had no stranger's blood, we had no fibers, we had no hairs, we had no forensic evidence, we had no eyewitnesses. And the question that was uppermost in our minds is where on earth do we start? With no potential leads at hand, the team of detectives led by Keith Petter working on Rachel's case had to investigate an array of suspects. They interviewed Rachel's family members, friends, and even local offenders, but to no avail. They all were looked at, despite some very, very intensive inquiries in respect of some of those other suspects, there was no evidence to put them either at the scene of the common or to link them with Rachel's death. Now, investigators had only one hope, Alex, Rachel's three-year-old son, and the sole eyewitness to the tragic murder. After the murder, Alex was taken to a child psychologist, Dr. Jean Harris Hendricks, who suggested that reliving his mother's death would be a harrowing experience for little Alex, and that the primary reason for the investigators to not approach him during the initial investigation. However, with no other viable options available, they found themselves compelled to reconsider the idea. With the presence of Dr. Harris Hendricks and Alex's father, Andre, the police conducted several sessions with Alex, seeking to extract vital information that could shed light on the identity of his mother's killer. The sessions were emotional and traumatic, to say the least, as each day Alex demonstrated the horrific attack. But incredibly, over the course of a few days, Alex was able to provide a description of the killer. He revealed that the assailant was a Caucasian man with short hair. He was wearing a white collared and buttoned shirt with blue trousers and dark shoes. He was also carrying a black bag with him. Alex remembered how, on that fateful day, around 10.30 a.m. in the morning, when he was taking a stroll with his mother and their dog, the man suddenly appeared from nowhere. Before they could react to anything, he threw Alex to the ground and dragged him through the mud. Then he launched the fatal attack on Rachel, killing her in the process. Once the deed was done, he washed his hands in the nearby stream and quickly fled the scene. It was incredible how a three-year-old boy could remember such intricate details even after experiencing such a devastating loss. But for the investigators, this was a promising lead, and they hoped the sketch created from Alex's description could narrow their search down. Scotland Yard, the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police Department, shared the picture with the media, appealing to the public for their assistance in providing further leads and information. Tonight, detectives are putting all their cards on the table and they're appealing for the whole nation's help. The man was in his 20s or 30s. He was tall, more than 5 feet 10, and had short brown hair. He had a white shirt with buttons and dark trousers, possibly blue, and was carrying a small, dark bag. Curiously, his belt was over his shirt rather than around his trousers. Or perhaps it was a dog lead. He seemed to bend forward slightly as he walked. Was he trying to hide his face? This seemed to be working as the police soon received a startling phone call. The call came from Jane Elizabeth Harriman, who reported seeing a man acting suspiciously on Wimbledon Common at around 10.10 10 a.m. on the day of the tragedy. The location of this encounter was only five minutes away from where the murder occurred. The man was described as being in his 20s or 30s, around 5 foot 10 inches tall, with short brown hair. The description closely matched a sketch of the suspect, who was wearing a white shirt, 
blue trousers, and carrying a dark bag. Interestingly, he was walking with a slight bend, as if attempting to hide his face. The man reappeared a few minutes later. Mrs. Harriman was concerned because she thought that he was following a woman. Eventually, the man went in the direction where Rachel Nickel's lifeless body was later discovered. Mrs. Harriman helped police build an artist's impression of the man, which closely resembled the description provided by Rachel's son. And he, he paused, and I sort of looked at him to smile, and he sort of, and he, he half smiled and turned his face away. He didn't look at me, he just turned his head away, and he seemed unsure of, of which way to go, and I didn't look back, and then I carried on walking past. Another woman, Amanda Phelan, noticed a suspicious-looking man washing his hands in a drainage ditch at 10.40 a.m., just 10 minutes after the murder was believed to have taken place. When police combed through the area, they came across a footprint. However, it yielded no further clues to the murder. In fact, investigators were not even sure if the print actually belonged to the killer or not. So instead, they chose to focus on the witness account. Amanda's description of the man bore a resemblance to Mrs. Harriman's artist impression sketch. Unfortunately, despite extensive efforts and a week's long search, no trace of the man matching the description was found. The investigation was at a standstill, but pressure was mounting on the authorities to solve the high-pressure murder case that had deeply affected the entire nation. So, they took a radical approach. A month into the investigation, Scotland Yard turned to Paul Britton, a renowned criminal psychologist who was known for his work on profiling criminals to provide his expertise. Britton, whose work inspired the television show Cracker, crafted two distinct profiles of Rachel's killer. The first profile painted a picture of a perpetrator in their 20s or 30s, taller than 5 foot 10, likely living alone and possibly residing in close proximity to the crime scene, the common. He would likely have been single or experienced failed relationships. The second profile delved into a more disturbing aspect, suggesting that the killer had an interest in the occult, a fascination with knives, and harbored sadistic fantasies. But the most unsettling revelation was his suggestion that the perpetrator might potentially strike again. With this new information in hand, the police launched a vast manhunt. As part of their investigation, they questioned more than 500 suspects in connection with the crime, of whom 32 were arrested but later released. Among them was Colin Stagg, a local man who found himself under scrutiny. The police believed that Colin Stagg resembled both the composite sketches created with the help of witnesses. Besides, multiple people saw him in the common on the morning of Rachel's murder. Even the offender profile provided by Paul Britton seemed to align with him. Colin lived alone in a flat near the Wimbledon Common. At the age of 29, he was unemployed and unmarried, just like Britton had suggested. In no time, he became the prime suspect. Intrigued by this potential lead, Detective Keith Petter decided to conduct a search of Colin's apartment. Little did he know that the search would uncover startling evidence, introducing new twists to the case. In Colin's apartment, detectives found numerous occult items, including drawings, books, and scribbles. Detectives discovered Colin following an ancient pagan religion known as Wicca, which involves the worship of nature and the practice of magic rituals. The back bedroom had drawing of um, pagan deities on the walls. There was a pentagram um, marked out on the, uh, the carpet. There was also a hooded black cowl uh, and habit in, in the wardrobe. Quite clearly, um, we were dealing with a, a very unusual individual. The discovery added another layer of complexity to the investigation. Once again, Britain's profile had been remarkably accurate. Following this discovery, Colin Stagg was arrested in connection with Rachel Nickel's murder and brought in for interrogation. Over the course of the next three days, Colin underwent intense questioning by the police. Investigators were desperate to discover anything that could implicate him in the murder, but it was easier said than done. So they focused their inquiries on key aspects, such as Colin's whereabouts on the day of the crime, his relationship with Rachel Nickel, and his knowledge of the events surrounding her tragic death. Colin stated that he had, indeed, taken his dogs for a short walk on Wimbledon Common between 8.15 and 9.15 a.m., asserting that he returned home more than an hour before Rachel was killed. While he insisted he never saw Rachel, he had another story of his own. He stated that on the common that day, he greeted a woman pushing a stroller with her baby in it. He claimed that he observed a menacing tall and broad man with short hair following her. 
Although the detectives could not find Colin's account entirely reliable, they still tried to verify his story. However, they couldn't find anyone who matched the description that Colin provided. We checked our database of witnesses and people who said they were on the common at the time, and we could find nobody who matched the descriptions that Colin had given us. Yet discrepancies to his statement were not limited to this. Colin's alibi was that he was back home by 9.15 in the morning, but one of his neighbors, Susan Gale, said she saw Colin making his way to the common between 9.25 and 9.30 wearing a white t-shirt, blue jeans, and a black bum bag. The description of his clothing had a strange similarity with the killer that Alex had described. As detectives delved deeper into Colin's life, they uncovered increasingly unsettling information. One notable discovery was a complaint made by a woman accusing Colin of exposing himself to her. This incident had occurred just a few months prior to Rachel's murder. When the police questioned Colin about the complaint, he claimed it was all a misunderstanding. According to Colin, he was sunbathing nude in a secluded area in Wimbledon Common, believing that nobody would come across him there. However, he was taken aback when the woman unexpectedly appeared. Colin emphasized that he had not intended to expose himself intentionally, and it was purely an unfortunate coincidence. This added weight to the already raised concerns about his behavior. Two days later, Colin Stagg was taken to the Brixton Police Department for an identity parade. There, Jane Harriman, the woman who had previously helped police with a composite sketch, positively identified Colin as the suspicious man she'd seen on the morning of July 15, 1992. Despite this unnerving affirmation, detectives had no concrete evidence to tie him to the murder. And with that, he was released from custody. He did, however, plead guilty to the indecent exposure charge and was fined £200 on September 21, 1992. With the media becoming aware of Colin's story, their interest in him grew significantly. Journalists sought to capture every aspect of his behavior and actions, as well as any public reactions he displayed, which included Colin's swift departure from the court while swearing at reporters. But in a sudden twist, this media attention brought a crucial lead to the investigators. They were contacted by a call from a woman identified only as Julie, who had pertinent information to share. Julie shared that almost two years earlier, she placed an ad in the newspaper in the Lonely Hearts column. For those who don't know, a Lonely Hearts column is a specific space in the newspaper where people can advertise seeking a new lover or friend. Julie revealed that almost immediately after placing the ad, she got an explicit fantasy letter from Colin Stagg. However, Julie disclosed that she did not pursue any further interaction with him. This newfound lead sparked an audacious idea in the mind of the lead detective Keith Petter, an undercover operation. It was named Operation Edsel. Through this undercover operation, detectives hoped to tap into Colin Stagg's innate fantasies as a potential strategy to elicit a confession. The intention was to create a scenario that would prompt Colin to reveal his involvement or provide incriminating information regarding Rachel's murder. If he did confess, it would serve as strong evidence against him. Even if he didn't confess despite the efforts made, it would potentially help rule him out as a suspect. They decided to utilize an undercover female officer to engage with Colin, leveraging his prior behavior and tendencies. Paul Britton also stepped up to assist and design the operation. But the plan was not as simple as it sounded. Everything was at stake. If something were to go wrong, the investigators could face severe consequences, including potential damage to their careers and even the possibility of losing their jobs. On the other hand, if the operation was successful, the potential benefit would be incalculable. Capturing a possible murderer who'd been walking free could bring a sense of justice to the victim's family and calm the fears of the wider community. Despite the inherent risks, the detectives involved in the case made the decision to move forward with their plan. One of my colleagues came up to me and said, you realize that if it goes wrong, that's your career buggered. We were treading on new ground. We were sailing uncharted waters. Um, it, was, it was completely new, but we didn't know what else to do. Meanwhile, Rachel's family was suffering in silence. The aftermath of the murder took an immense toll on her family, particularly on young Alex and his father, Andre. Alex's traumatic experience of witnessing the murder left him suffering from horrific nightmares for months. As the only parent left to raise his son, Andre initially tried to comfort and wake Alex from his distressing dreams. 
However, he eventually realized that his son needed time and space to heal in his own way. Alongside their personal struggles, Rachel's family had to contend with relentless media attention. The constant presence of the media invaded their privacy each and every day. But the situation worsened when a full-colored picture of Alex was published, raising concerns about his safety as the killer remained on the loose. Fearing for their well-being and seeking respite from the media circus, seven months after Rachel's killing, Andre made the difficult decision to relocate with Alex. They first sought solace in the south of France, where the distance from the media spotlight provided some relief for Alex to cope with his emotional anguish. Later, they moved to Barcelona, Spain, in a bid to start a new life. By the start of 1993, the police had finalized their plan for Colin Stagg. In January of that year, with Keith Petter leading the way, Operation Edsel commenced. A female undercover officer, using the alias Lizzie James, initiated contact with Colin, pretending to be acquainted with Julie, the woman he'd corresponded with previously. Colin was as intrigued by the letter as he was flattered by the attention. Lizzie's expressed interest in getting to know him prompted to respond promptly with his own letters. Over a period of the next seven months, Lizzie and Colin exchanged a total of 43 letters. Lizzie's letters were filled with explicit fantasies, but Colin's responses were more on the innocent side. As time went on, Lizzie wrote more letters and the fantasies got stronger, but Colin did not seem to come out of his shell. All the while, Keith Petter and Paul Britton watched over the whole process and even provided their input. Despite the provocative content of Lizzie's letters, Colin did not seem to provide a single clue that could connect him to Rachel or any other woman in a criminal manner. Desperate for answers, in March of 1993, detectives decided to adopt a more forthcoming approach. Lizzie started expressing in her letters that she enjoyed being humiliated and dominated by men during intimate moments. She further conveyed her desire for Colin to feel powerful and take control over her, somewhat trying to control his murderous instinct. This time, in his response, he'd acknowledged that he could hurt her if that would please her. But additionally, he conveyed that he was not a violent man, so he'd prefer a gentler way. Although up to this point, investigators did not have any evidence to implicate him in any kind of crime, they were quite adamant that he was playing smart by not revealing his deepest desires. Otherwise, he wouldn't have entertained Lizzie this far. In May of 1993, Colin Stagg expressed his desire to meet Lizzie, the undercover officer, in person. The detectives recognized this as a potential opportunity to gather more information and induce truth from Colin. They agreed to arrange a meeting. A public park was chosen as the location for the meeting, ensuring the presence of undercover officers to closely monitor the interaction. Lizzie James was well aware of the psychological battle she'd have to engage in with Colin Stagg, as she'd been briefed by Paul Britton. She had been given a very, very detailed briefing by Paul Britton as to what to expect, how to behave. Not only had she got to play her part, she also had to stay as far as possible within the realms of what is accepted legally. The task facing her was, was one that would, would frighten um, the living daylights out of most people. But the question remained, would she be successful in uncovering Colin's dark secrets? On the scheduled day, Colin Stagg arrived at the park early. Detectives were concerned that Stagg might detect something amiss and abandon the meeting. However, to their relief, Colin decided to wait for Lizzie to arrive. After a brief introduction, Colin and Lizzie went to a restaurant with undercover officers discreetly following their trail. In an effort to provoke a reaction and potentially elicit revealing information from Colin Stagg, Lizzie shared a lurid story during their lunch together. She played her role as bait and disclosed personal details about herself, including a fabricated account of being involved in black magic and satanic rituals with a former boyfriend. She went on to claim that they'd participated in a disturbing human sacrifice involving a pregnant woman and a baby. Even then, Colin stayed guarded about his experiences. At the end of their lunch date, Colin handed Lizzie a letter, and the two went their separate ways with the promise of meeting again. Colin Stagg's lack of disclosure frustrated the detectives. They were on the verge of losing hope when an unexpected twist emerged from the darkness. The newest letter to Lizzie introduced a disturbing element to the story. In the letter, he talked about his disturbing fantasies, along with his desires for knives and blood. 
This was further proof to the investigators that they were on to the right man. The contents included a sexual fantasy on Wimbledon Common, uh, which involved the use of a knife, the cutting of flesh, and the, the flowing of blood. Uh, and this was the first time that there had been any indication, uh, any mention of knives, or blood, or the use of any of those items for sexual gratification. In later correspondence, Lizzie continued to push his boundaries, saying that her preference was someone who was violent, referring to the Rachel Nickel case. Colin admitted to being on the common in the morning, but went no further than that. In the final attempts to obtain a confession, Lizzie persisted that she wished that Colin was responsible for the Wimbledon common murder. However, Colin admitted that police had questioned him about Rachel's murder, but maintained his innocence. The conversation was secretly taped. I wish you had done it. I know you got away with it. That's brilliant. I wish you had. However, detectives were yet to find any conclusive proof to implicate Colin Stagg in the murder of Rachel Nickel. Almost a year after Rachel's death, Colin Stagg gave an interview to Daily Start, insisting that he had nothing to do with her murder. Detectives realized that the chances of Colin admitting to Rachel's murder were very slim, now more so than ever when he publicly released a statement denying any involvement. The undercover operation was aborted. With Operation Edsel no longer in play, the investigators would refocus their efforts on the existing evidence. They believed that they'd accumulated sufficient evidence to obtain a conviction against Colin Stagg in relation to the murder of Rachel Nickel. The key elements included Mrs. Harriman's identification of Colin, his presence at Wimbledon on the day of the crime, and his explicit fantasy letters to Lizzie James. On August 17, 1993, Colin Stagg was arrested for the second time in connection to Rachel Nickel's murder. This time, he chose to practice his right to remain silent. But on the 15th of July, 1992, at Wimbledon Common, you murdered Rachel McKell, causing her death by multiple stab wounds. As a last resort, psychologists Paul Britton and Scotland Yard detectives decided to employ a strategy where Lizzie James would enter the interview room unannounced in an attempt to prompt Colin Stagg to talk. When Colin learned that he'd been set up, he appeared upset and remained tight-lipped in his words. Yes, I'm a serving police officer. For the purposes of this interview, I'm known as Lizzie James. More than a year after Rachel Nickel's horrific murder, Colin Stagg was officially charged with the crime. He'd spend the next 13 months in custody, all the while protesting his innocence. Despite a lack of forensic evidence, Investigators thought that the case against Colin was strong and that winning a conviction was possible. The Crown Prosecution Service also felt that there were sustainable grounds to proceed. Colin's trial was set for February of 1994 in Old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court of England and Wales. But before the jury could be sworn in, the defense requested before the judge that the undercover operation be ruled as inadmissible evidence. They argued that the operation had no direct connection to the actual case and raised concerns about its legality and ethical implications. In contrast, the prosecution contended that the undercover operation was instrumental in delving into the accused's innermost fantasies, which they believed likely played a role as a motive in the crime. The legal battle delayed the trial for a few months until it finally began in September 1994. In a stunning twist, after several days of deliberation, Mr. Justice Ognell rejected the evidence presented by the prosecution branding it as a honey trap. He heavily criticized the Metropolitan Police's handling of the case, particularly Operation Edsel. He even expressed concerns about the methods employed, stating that they went beyond what was legally acceptable. Therefore, due to a lack of evidence, Colin Stagg was acquitted. It was a significant setback for the Metropolitan Police and the prosecution. The investigation into the murder of Rachel Nickel spanned over two years and involved a substantial number of resources including a collection of 4,500 statements and significant man hours dedicated to the case. The cost incurred during the investigation was reported to be over three million pounds. It was the largest murder investigation in British history, which collapsed on the very first day of the trial. The acquittal of their prime suspect infuriated Scotland Yard. 
But it was nothing compared to the vehement reaction of the press and the public. Though Colin Stagg gained his freedom, outside of the courtroom, another trial awaited him. This trial by the media fueled the stigma about people's perception of him, which would continue to ruin his life for years to come. Every so often his name appeared in the newspapers as the man who possibly got away with murder. His home was frequently vandalized and people painted it with vulgar graffiti labeling him as a killer. London police maintained their belief in Colin Stagg's guilt even after the trial. Colin Stagg has been through a version of justice, albeit truncated, and he has been found not guilty. But I wonder whether he can actually say hand on heart that he believes people, when they meet him in the street, believe that. But I do not believe the system served anybody that particular day. Metropolitan Chief Commissioner of Police Paul Condon announced that they felt the outcome of the trial was influenced by skilled lawyers who were able to secure Colin Stagg's acquittal. Thus, they'd not be looking for anyone else. The outcome was heartbreaking for Rachel's family. The law has been upheld, but where is the justice? I understand that the police will now keep the files on my daughter's murder open, but they are not looking for anyone else. Following this tiring ordeal, Scotland Yard, too, faced significant criticism. The criminal psychologist Paul Britton took the most heat. Although he later tried to claim that he had no knowledge about the fantasy letters, that fact had been disputed by many. The British Psychological Society even charged Britain with professional misconduct. However, due to delays in the case, it was eventually dismissed. Keith Pedler was not left behind either. His career was finished and he took early retirement from the police force. Lizzie James also followed the same path. After claiming to experience stress and mental breakdown due to the investigation, she too took early retirement from the police force and sued for damages. The case was settled out of court in 2001, resulting in a payment of £125,000 to Lizzie James. The payout also drew significant criticism, particularly because Rachel's son Alex had been granted £22,000 compensation, which was less than a fifth of the amount paid to the undercover detective. With a lack of leads to follow, Rachel Nickel's case went cold after this. Each year, however, on the anniversary of Rachel's death, there was mounting pressure on Scotland Yard to bring justice to the deceased mother. In 2002, 10 years after the murder of Rachel Nickel, Scotland Yard initiated a cold case review team to re-examine the case. The team consisted of a small group of officers and retired investigators who analyzed witness statements, reviewed files on potential suspects, and explored the possibility of connections between the case and other crimes. But they had another weapon up their sleeve too. Over these 10 years, DNA testing had vastly improved, enabling investigators to obtain more reliable and conclusive results. It played a pivotal role in bringing perpetrators to justice. So naturally, the cold case review team also turned to advanced DNA technologies. For the next 18 months, forensic experts extensively examined and tested Rachel Nickel's clothing. Finally, in July 2003, a significant development occurred police discovered male DNA. Although the DNA sample was not sufficient to confirm the identity of the individual, it played a crucial role in eliminating any previous suspects who'd been under investigation. The sample did not match the DNA of Andre, Alex, or any of the investigators, indicating that it had most likely come from the killer. In a turn of events that defied all expectations and shattered long-held beliefs, the unforeseen twist in the investigation came with the revelation that the DNA evidence had also ruled out Colin Stagg as a suspect. After having been the center of intense scrutiny and suspicion, Colin suddenly found himself exonerated by scientific evidence. But this revelation meant that the investigation was thrust back to square one. However, it also widened the path for a fair investigation for the first time in years. It would be another year before the potential breakthrough in unraveling Rachel Nickel's killer emerged. In July of 2004, 12 years after Rachel Nickel's death, the DNA evidence finally linked the murder to a 38-year-old man, Robert Knapper. Born on February 25, 1966, in Aerith, southeast London, Robert Knapper was the eldest child of his parents, Brian and Pauline Knapper. He, alongside his two brothers and one sister, 
endured a dysfunctional childhood due to the deeply troubled relationship between his parents. His father, a bus conductor by profession, regularly abused his mother, Pauline, leading to their divorce when Napper was just nine years old. After they divorced, the children all went into foster care and underwent psychiatric treatment for six years at the Maudsley Hospital in Camberwell. During his stay there, Napper was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and paranoid schizophrenia. He seemed to be very frustrated with, um, with people and, and get into a lot of trouble. A child with Asperger's can have a very difficult time making friends and keeping friends and really knowing what's socially appropriate. These diagnoses likely contributed to his awkwardness at school. But his personality drastically changed when he was 12 or 13 after a family member assaulted him during a camping trip. As a result, he became incredibly shy and reclusive. But that didn't stop him from bullying his younger siblings and spying on his younger sister when she undressed. At 16, Napper left school and pursued a catering course along with a slew of menial jobs. His behavior became increasingly erratic with age. So much so that his mother threw him out of her house when he became 18 because she could no longer put up with him. Napper's criminal activities began in 1986 at the age of 20. He was arrested for carrying a loaded air gun and shooting small animals in the local woods. He was given a one-year conditional discharge. But from there, his crimes became far more serious, while his intentions became vile. In August of 1989, he assaulted a 31-year-old woman at knife point in her Plumstead common home. In November, Napper's mother Pauline called the police and told them that her son had confessed to an assault. Unfortunately, the police didn't seem to take much interest in the call, as Napper wasn't linked to any attack and wasn't even questioned. At this point, Pauline had no other option but to break off all connection with her eldest son. From 1989 to 1992, Napper attacked numerous women and assaulted some of them. But he always stayed one step ahead of the law. Or should we say, the authorities never bothered to look deeper. Even in August of 1992, when the police had twice been tipped off about him by neighbors. They asked him to give a blood sample both times. And both times he failed to turn up. Yet he was eliminated as a suspect due to a height discrepancy between the assailant and Robert Napper. In October of 1992, Robert Knapper was arrested for stalking a civilian employee at the Plumstead police station, leading to a search of his apartment. During their search, they found a red toolbox which contained a 22 caliber pistol, two knives, a crossbow, and a cache of ammunition, along with several maps containing markings, notes on binding and restraining people, a diary filled with suspicious entries, and a fitness card belonging to a blonde woman. Even with a mountain of evidence, Robert Knapper was only charged with firearm violations. What's worse, despite a psychiatric report clearly describing him as without a doubt an immediate threat to himself and the public, he was merely given an eight-week custodial sentence and no further inquiries regarding the search were pursued. On November 3, 1993, a horrifying incident occurred at the Bissett home in Plumstead. Robert Knapper stabbed 27-year-old Samantha Bissett in her neck and chest, resulting in her death. He then proceeded to smother her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine Jemima Bissett. Napper maimed Samantha's body and kept some body parts as trophies. The crime scene was so gruesome that the assigned police photographer had to take a two-year leave of absence due to the traumatic experience. Following the recovery of a fingerprint belonging to Napper from Samantha's flat, he was arrested and charged with the murders of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett in May 1994. In October of 1995, Napper pleaded guilty to manslaughter on grounds of diminished responsibility due to his mental illness and was sentenced to indefinite detention at the Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital in London, where he was being held at the time. The circumstances of Samantha and Rachel's murders were eerily similar. So, in December 1995, Napper was questioned about the death of Rachel Nickel, but he denied any involvement in that case. It's disturbing to think that had the police done their job with full competency, Samantha and Jasmine would have still been alive. Napper was also strongly believed to be responsible for the majority, if not all, of the attacks attributed to the Green Chain Rapist. This notorious assailant gained the nickname from the Green Chain Walk, a series of interconnected pathways spanning various parts of Southeast London. Over a span of four years, ending in 1994, this individual committed at least 70 assaults across the region. 
Four of the earliest of the Green Chain assaults have been connected to Napper, particularly based on his own admissions in 1995. The evidence strongly implicated him as the perpetrator of these heinous crimes. And then there was Rachel Nickel's killing in the middle of everything. It's hard to fathom how Paul Britton, the criminal profiler and psychologist who is also working on the Green Chain Assaults case and the double murder case of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett, along with Rachel Nickel's murder case, could have missed the similarities between the three crimes. During further investigation, additional links connecting Robert Knapper to the crimes were discovered. Napper's shoes turned out to match the shoe print discovered near the stream on Wimbledon Common at the time of Rachel's killing, where a man had been observed washing blood from his hands. Moreover, the small flecks of red paint that were found in Alex's hair were also determined to be a match for the red paint found on a toolbox discovered in Napper's apartment. Furthermore, in August 1993, a knife was discovered buried in a box on Wimbledon Common, located only 800 yards away from where Rachel Nickel was attacked. Fingerprints from this knife were later matched to Robert Knapper. No two fingerprints can ever be identical, but there were very, very many similarities and written those fingerprints off as Samantha's. Luckily for us, the um, fingerprints were on record and they came back to Robert Knapper. However, at the time of this discovery, the detectives working on Rachel's murder case had already formed the belief that Colin Stagg was the perpetrator, and the information linking Napper to the knife was disregarded. These pieces of evidence played a crucial role in establishing a connection between Napper and Rachel's murder, providing further support for his involvement in these horrific incidents. In July 2006, a team from Scotland Yard visited Broadmoor, Berkshire, to interview one of its inmates, Robert Napper, regarding Rachel Nickel's murder. At that time, 40-year-old Napper was housed in the Psychiatric Institute, having been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and Asperger's syndrome. However, Napper did not provide any assistance. On November 28, 2007, Robert Napper was officially charged with the murder of Rachel Nickel. He pleaded not guilty to Rachel Nickel's murder, and the trial commenced on November 11, 2008. During the proceedings on December 18, 2008, at the Old Bailey, Napper changed his plea to guilty for the manslaughter of Rachel Nickel on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Mr. Napper has been found guilty of Rachel's murder. That means in total, he has murdered two women, one child, at least one woman, and attempted to two others. We sincerely hope, whatever the court says, that he will spend the rest of his life in a totally secure environment to protect all other people. Judge Griffith Williams, presiding over the case, declared Napper to be a very dangerous man and ordered his indefinite detention at Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital. Given the seriousness of Robert Napper's crimes and the indefinite detention order imposed by the court, it's highly unlikely that he'll ever be released into society again. Finally, after 16 years and many twists and turns later, justice for Rachel Nickel was finally served. In 2008, London police were forced to make a public apology to Colin Stagg. I need to and must set the record straight with regard to Colin Stagg. In August 1993, he was wrongly accused of Rachel's murder. It is clear that he is completely innocent of any involvement in that case. And I today apologise to him for the mistakes that were made in the early 1990s. Additionally, he was awarded £706,000 in compensation as a result of the mishandling of the police investigation and the wrongful accusation into the murder of Rachel Nickel. Colin Stagg has expressed that he does not hold any grudge against the police. However, he has expressed animosity towards Paul Britton. Colin believes that Britton's criminal profiling had a detrimental impact on his life, leading to false assumptions and biases against him. Rachel Nickel's son, Alex, still lives in Barcelona with his father. At 27, he's a yoga teacher by profession. Despite enduring the unimaginable tragedy, Alex has managed to grow into a sensible individual. He's written a book about this tragedy, naming it Letting Go, a true story of murder, loss, and survival. Reflecting a profound level of forgiveness and emotional maturity on his part, Alex says he holds no animosity towards the man who turned his life upside down. 
Well, you know, everyone's going to make mistakes. We're all human. You know, in this story, it's not about whether the police, the police made mistakes or they didn't make mistakes. You know, it's about the institution becoming bigger than the individual it's designed to protect. So when you have a system of dark corridors like we have in the police, it attracts people who are more prone to incompetence and more prone to corruption. And that's what happened in our story, you know. It's also remarkable how his father, Andre, at 55 years old, can express forgiveness towards Robert Knapper and even demonstrate a degree of sympathy for him. Forgiveness for us is that if you don't forgive the person who caused you harm, then you become that person in time, he stated. Despite the forgiveness extended by the victim's family, it's undeniable that had law enforcement done its job effectively in this case, a multitude of victims could have been spared from unimaginable suffering. The failures and mishandling of the investigation allowed the perpetrator to continue his reign of terror, inflicting harm upon innocent individuals. This story serves as a stark reminder of the crucial role law enforcement plays in protecting and serving the community, and the devastating consequences that can arise when their duty is not fulfilled with utmost diligence. As we bring our exploration of the Rachel Nickel case to a close, one question remains. Could Robert Knapper have been stopped sooner? Or do you think he would have evaded the law anyway? He was, you know, hooked up to a respirator and all kinds of tubes going in and out of him, and it was awful. She uh, took him from me and said that it's over with. He's gone. <laughs> I went up to the phone and it was David's voice and he told me he died. I started begging that he could come up and see me and this deputy on duty said he could. So. The year was 1989 when the Stallings family's seemingly perfect life took an ominous turn. David and Patricia Stallings' three-month-old son, Ryan, fell ill. In the quiet suburb of Hillsboro, Missouri, the Stallings couple rushed him into a hospital. They were concerned, but they had no idea what was happening to their son. Vomiting, struggling to breathe, and with an insidious poison coursing through his veins, the medical staff feared the worst. He had been poisoned with antifreeze. As accusations loomed over 24-year-old Patricia, Ryan's mother, she was named as a baby killer. Soon, an intensive investigation began, but what was the truth? Why would a first-time mother try to kill her own son? Living in Hillsboro, Missouri in 1989 was a charming experience, defined by the warmth and close-knit community spirit of the small town. Neighbors knew each other by name, and shared a sense of camaraderie that made the city feel like one big family. The strong agricultural roots were evident, with many families engaged in farming and agriculture-related businesses. The simplicity of life allowed for children to play freely in the neighborhood streets, and friendships forged during these carefree moments. Apart from the friendly neighborhoods, the sense of family was strong. Among 1,625 people living in Hillsborough in 1989, one was Patricia Stallings. During the mid-1980s, Patricia was a clerk at a quaint little convenience store in St. Louis. Little did she know that fate had something extraordinary in store for her. A man named David Stallings was a regular customer whose visits became more than just quick stops for snacks and drinks. Their encounters evolved into something special, and in 1986, they began dating. As the years rolled by, their love blossomed. Finally, in 1988, they sealed their commitment by getting married. The vibrant city life of St. Louis welcomed them, but they chose a cozy home in Hillsboro, Missouri. Just when they thought life couldn't get any sweeter, they were blessed with a baby boy on April 4th, 1989. They named him Ryan. Ever since he was born, he suffered from gastric distress. It was not long before their world was turned upside down. In July 1989, just three months after their son was born, they witnessed him suffering from alarming symptoms. He was struggling to breathe and vomiting incessantly. Ryan was rushed to Cardinal Glennon Children's Hospital on July 9, 1989. 
the dedicated medical team sprang into action right away. It wasn't uncommon for newborns to face health issues, but it became a problem when the symptoms did not reduce even after treatment. The medical staff put Ryan in the ICU immediately and took blood samples to check for infections. Ryan's father, David Stallings, said that the staff did not know what was wrong with him. He said, It was just a shock to see a little baby incapacitated the way he was. It was to the point where they said, Well, they don't know how long he's going to be here. It was to the point where they said, Well, they don't know how long he's going to be here. We don't know what's wrong with him yet, so you might as well just go to the waiting room and uh, stay out there until we can tell you what's wrong. He was you know, hooked up to a respirator and all kinds of tubes going in and out of him, and it was awful. David and Patricia rented a hospital room to be available whenever they were needed by the doctors. Hours were passing by, but there was no improvement in Ryan's health, nor could the doctors identify the problem he was facing. In the meantime, the hospital staff made a shocking discovery. Ryan's blood showed an unusually high level of what they believed to be ethylene glycol, a toxic component found in antifreeze. Acetone is in fingernail polish remover, for example. She goes, do you have any in the house? Patty uses it on her fingernails to uh, remove her old fingernail polish. He goes, well, that's got acetone in it. I said, okay. He said, do you have antifreeze? I said, yes, I have antifreeze. I just rebuilt a radiator on my vehicle. The staff was polite to the Stallings couple when they informed them that their son would recover. But no doubt, everyone in charge of Ryan's safety was suspicious of the couple. Patricia and David were not allowed to be in Ryan's room alone. They were not permitted to be by the bedside, and every time they were in the room, the presence of doctors and nurses was made necessary. You know, that bothered me, but I still didn't understand because I wasn't looking at it the way they were, I guess. The detectives were called in, and David and Patricia Stallings were taken into separate rooms for interrogation. In Patricia's words, They were saying that they knew that that baby had been poisoned by either me or my husband. It infuriated me. And I, I was just, I was devastated. I was blown away. I just could not believe that they could even think. I mean, Ryan was my world, you know? I mean, Ryan, he was so beautiful. He was perfect. Following the test results, the safety of the infant Ryan became a top priority. So when his condition improved, he was released from the hospital. But the Stallings couple were not allowed to take him home. Instead, Ryan was placed in protective custody. A social worker come up to us and told us that they were taking custody of Ryan from us. And at that point, I became very angry. Why are you doing this to us, is what I told her. And uh, she said, well, this is policy. When uh, there's a suspected uh, poison, we take children from the parents and put them in foster care. His parents were allowed to see him for one hour every Thursday. Ryan knew when we met him the first time, he, he was so happy to see both of us again. He just smiled, the biggest smile you could ever possibly see on a baby's face. I just could not wait till Thursday. You know, I would just, my whole week, I would tell everybody over and over and over how last Thursday went. Despite this, Patricia Stallings was granted a brief period of alone time with her son on the sixth visit on August 31st, 1989. It was the visit when David's parents were invited for the first time. About 20 minutes later, Ryan's grandparents decided to leave, so David escorted them out and walked down the hall, leaving Patricia alone with Ryan. David was back in the room within 45 seconds at the most. However, something was not right. Ryan's health seemed to deteriorate again when he suffered from another bout of uncontrollable vomiting, only three days after the visit. The medical team acted swiftly, and to everyone's surprise, the issue was that Ryan had been poisoned once again. Not only that, the detectives made an important discovery. They'd found antifreeze at the Stallings' house. So, in the aftermath, on September 5, 1989, when Patricia and David were getting into their car, some police officers asked them to stop. Patricia invited them into the house, but the officers told her that she wasn't allowed inside the house and immediately handcuffed her. Patricia Stallings found herself arrested on assault charges. I knew it wasn't true. I didn't care what they thought. 
I just thought, well, you know, I'll be home in a couple hours. This will be over with. You know, I'll get to go be with Ryan. And then the day turned into a night. And then it got really serious. I got really scared. While his mother was behind bars, Ryan was treated for ethylene glycol poisoning. But everyone knew that he was slowly dying even after being placed on life support systems. Despite the best efforts of the medical staff, his young life was on the verge of ending, so they told David to contact a minister and get him baptized. David wanted his wife Patricia to be there, but the judge could not let it happen. He said that, I'm not going to let a baby killer up there. And I, I said, this lady did not kill this baby. On September 7, 1989, the doctors consulted with David on whether they should turn the life support machine off, and David unwillingly agreed. I told him, I go ahead and shut the machine down. But I wanted to be in there with him. So for three hours, I sat there with him in my arms, knowing that Patty couldn't be there watching this meter on this machine go down each time his heart would beat. It was hard. It's something I would never ask anybody ever to do. At 6.30 p.m., one of the doctors shut off the machine to monitor his heart rate. She uh, took him from me and said, that it's over with, he's gone. <laughs> So, on September 7th, 1989, just two days after he was admitted to the hospital for the second time, Ryan succumbed to the effects of the poison. Patricia was informed about this almost three hours later, around 9 p.m. I went up to the phone and it was David's voice and he told me he died. And I started begging that he could come up and see me and this Deputy on duty said he could. So. <laughs> a 24 year old mother had poisoned her own son, or that was something the news channels were reporting. The gravity of the situation couldn't be ignored, and the charges against Patricia Stallings were elevated to first degree murder, and she was held without bail. It was a much-reported case, and the severity of the crime was not about to go unnoticed. So when Patricia requested to attend her only son's funeral, she was denied that opportunity. The authorities sought to uncover the truth behind this devastating loss. While Patricia Stallings awaited trial, she discovered that she was pregnant again. Another chapter of heartache was about to unfold in front of her. In the midst of her incarceration, she gave birth to another baby boy, David Jr., on February 17, 1990, he was one month premature. Tragically, he too faced a series of concerning symptoms, mirroring those that had affected his late brother Ryan, even though he'd not been in contact with his mother after his birth. In a twist of fate, David Jr., or DJ, was diagnosed with methylmalonic acidemia, MMA, a genetic condition that produces propionic acid, a compound different from ethylene glycol by just one carbon atom. It would be very simple to confuse the diagnosis of MMA with multiple poisonings because the symptoms are very similar. But more importantly than that, MMA and other similar disorders are very rare and the majority of doctors either will never have seen a case or if they have seen a case didn't know that they saw it and actually confused it. The diagnosis was a critical piece of information, shedding light on the tragic circumstances that had befallen both of Patricia's sons. David Jr. recovered from his ordeal, but David Sr. was not allowed to take his own child back home. Instead, he was placed in foster care. While the fate of baby David was being decided, on the other hand, a legal battle ensued. This new angle of her second son being diagnosed with MMA rewrote Patricia's story and her defense team had a strong and valid argument by now. She said, Her defense attorney, Eric Rathbone, sought to introduce the theory that Ryan had died of MMA, pointing to the sibling's diagnosis as a crucial factor. 
But the prosecutor, George B. McElroy, disagreed, considering the diagnosis irrelevant to Ryan's death. While her defense team claimed that she was alone with Ryan for about 45 seconds on the sixth visit, the prosecution claimed that Patricia had anywhere from three to eight minutes during which she fed Ryan using a bottle. They suspected that she'd poisoned that bottled milk with antifreeze or ethylene glycol. David Stallings provided a testimony in his wife's favor, claiming to have seen the bottle. He said that Ryan was getting cranky, so he took the bottle out of the bag and started feeding him. David highlighted that there was no smell or discoloration. In his words, there was nothing done to that bottle. Absolutely nothing. One bottle, which was identified as the bottle she had fed the baby with, actually contained traces of ethylene glycol. That bottle had actually been prepared by the foster mother and retrieved from the baby bag during the visit, but the state believes and certainly circumstantial evidence suggests that she slipped ethylene glycol or antifreeze into the bottle during that feeding. Ryan was taken from the visit by the DFS worker to the foster parents' home, but later that day, or, or actually early the next morning, was taken to what we call respite home, a, a temporary uh, foster parents who kept them just for the weekend. The second set of foster parents, not knowing what the child was like, m may well have overlooked symptoms that the first set would have seen. When the defense team argued that Ryan died of natural causes, the prosecutor, McElroy, said, you might as well speculate that some little man from Mars came down and shot him full of some mysterious bacteria. Soon enough, a significant breakthrough occurred in Patricia Stallings' case. Defense attorney Eric Rathbone managed to obtain copies of crucial notes written by assistant prosecutor John S. Applebaum. These notes revealed that the doctor who declared Ryan's death had indeed considered the possibility of an MMA diagnosis. However, at the time, no test had been conducted to confirm this potential medical condition. First cases in the family are often missed, and it's only when it reoccurs again that the medical practitioners are tipped off to the fact that this may well be a genetic disorder, and maybe the first child had that as well. The discovery of these notes opened up new avenues of inquiry and raised questions about the original assessment of Ryan's cause of death. Prosecutors, however, stood firm in their stance, asserting that ethylene glycol found in Ryan's blood and propylene glycol that's formed due to MMA were very different from one another. They emphasized that even if Ryan had MMA, they still believed he'd been poisoned. The revelation of these notes prompted further scrutiny of the evidence presented and the validity of the initial conclusions drawn by the prosecution. As the trial progressed, Patricia wanted her attorney to call character witnesses to testify on her behalf, but her wishes went unheeded. The presiding judge, Gary Kramer, concurred ruling that the theory could not be advanced without concrete evidence that Ryan had indeed been affected by MMA. Ultimately, on March 4, 1991, the court found her guilty of first-degree murder, and she received a life sentence. David passed out after hearing the verdict and was rushed to the hospital. He knew his Patty could not have hurt her own child. The spotlight on Patricia Stallings' case intensified when it was featured on the television program Unsolved Mysteries, on May 8, 1991. Among the thousands of people who watched the episode, there was William Sly, a biochemist from St. Louis University. The case was puzzling, to say the least, and he wanted to help shed light on it. So, William collaborated with Dr. James Shoemaker, a skilled expert in the field, who served as the director of the Metabolic Screening Lab at the university. William and Dr. James's collaboration led to a breakthrough revelation. The analysis of Ryan's blood confirmed that he had indeed suffered from methylmalonic acidemia, MMA, a condition that had not been previously identified during the initial investigation. This discovery was critical, but even so, the allegations against Patricia stood firm. Because ethylene glycol, the toxic substance initially suspected, was not produced naturally in the human body, even in cases of MMA. So, even if Ryan suffered from the same condition as David Jr., it did not explain how his blood had ethylene glycol in it. As the case gained further attention, Dr. Shoemaker sought answers and requested information on the methods used to measure ethylene glycol in Ryan's blood. Prosecutor George McElroy agreed to provide the necessary information. What happened next completely changed what everyone thought they knew about the case. The results revealed that propionic acid, 
a byproduct of MMA, had caused a result that careless observers might have mistaken for ethylene glycol. I've lost one child to MMA. My second child is stricken with MMA and may not live. He's a year old now, and they're still not sure how to treat him. I lost my freedom. I've lost everything. Dr. Shoemaker took the investigation a step further by sending samples of propionate spiked blood to multiple laboratories who applied the same testing methods employed in the Stallings case. Some of these laboratories arrived at an incorrect conclusion, suggesting ethylene glycol poisoning as a cause. However, amid the confusion and conflicting findings, the collaboration and expertise of William Sly and Dr. Shoemaker continued to make strides. They sought additional support from Dr. Piero Rinaldo of Yale University, whose insights proved instrumental in shedding light on the case. Rinaldo's thorough examination led him to the conclusion that Ryan's death was not the result of ethylene glycol poisoning, but instead stemmed from MMA. With Rinaldo's testimony supporting the new understanding, a shift occurred in the perspective of Prosecutor George McElroy. The mounting evidence, combined with Rinaldo's expert analysis, raised serious doubts about the previous poisoning theory. The possibility that Ryan had not been poisoned began to gain traction, leading to a reassessment of the case. Patricia was filled with hope. Patricia Stallings' legal journey took a positive twist on July 30, 1991, when, after spending about two years behind bars, she was granted release pending a new trial. But she was not completely free yet. Patricia was placed under house arrest. As the legal battle continued, the weight of uncertainty and the toil of imprisonment took a toll on Stallings, causing her to lose a significant amount of weight. She said that during this testing period of her life, she relied on her Buddhist faith, from which she gained strength to continue fighting. On September 20th, 1991, a momentous announcement brought closure to the long-fought battle for justice. George McElroy, the prosecutor, held a press conference to reveal that all charges against Patricia Stallings were being dismissed. He offered an apology to her, expressing regret for the hardship she'd endured. Finally, the case against her was dropped. Unfortunately, we can't undo the suffering that the Stallings have endured during this entire ordeal. And I apologize to them, both personally and for the state of Missouri. David Stallings said, The Stallings family was finally able to welcome David Jr. home in October 1991. I just want to make up for the year and a half that we didn't have him. And it's hard to make up that much time, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Despite the fears surrounding his condition, David and Patricia remained steadfast in their belief that they would help him overcome his challenges. Patricia, in particular, felt a deep sense of relief and happiness to reclaim her life after the harrowing ordeal. David and Patricia decided to take legal action against those involved in the incorrect diagnosis of their late son, Ryan. They filed lawsuits against Cardinal Glennon Hospital, St. Louis University Hospital, the doctors, and Smith Klein Beecham Clinical Laboratories. They asserted that the hospitals had neglected to conduct additional testing even after David Jr.'s correct diagnosis of MMA. In 1992, Cardinal Glennon, St. Louis University, and the doctors opted for an out-of-court settlement to resolve the matter. The following year, they also reached a settlement agreement with Smith Klein. As a result of these legal victories, the Stallings family received significant financial compensation. However, life's challenges were not yet over for the family. Tragedy struck again when David Jr. passed away on September 17, 2013, at the age of 23. The loss of their beloved son was undoubtedly devastating. Adding to the heartache, David Stallings passed away on April 30, 2019, after a prolonged illness. From the heartache of losing her beloved son, Ryan, to the joy of being reunited with her second child, David Jr., Patricia's life journey was an emotional roller coaster. There are several cases of false accusations which do not yield the same happy results as in Patricia's case. Even though she won the legal battle, those two years spent under the pressure of being labeled a baby killer could not be reversed. Although David Jr. didn't live a long life, he spent his days with his family in their care and love. 
Patricia could have given the same support to her first son, Ryan, but she was not even allowed to attend his funeral, let alone in his hospital room. At least Patricia's love enabled her second son to live 23 years of his life. On the night of April 30th, 1996, officers from the Manchester Police Department arrived at the home of Doug and Gail Islieb after receiving a distressing phone call. Manchester emergency. There's a robbery here. I think somebody shot at my wife. I just saw somebody there with a mask. There, they found 54-year-old Gail slumped across the front seat of her car with broken glass littering the ground and several bullet shell casings inside the vehicle. It was clear to the officers that Gail was dead. At first, it looked like a carjacking gone wrong, but Gail's murder left her family and neighbors in disbelief. But as the investigation deepened, police began to uncover a tale of jealousy, madness, and obsession. Who would want to harm kind-hearted Gail? And why had it been such a attack? Founded in the year 1672, the town of Manchester in Hartford County, Connecticut, slowly developed into an industrial center in the United States due to several rivers and brooks that provided hydropower to the paper and textile industry. Now, the 59,000 people who call it home enjoy the charms of small town living with easy access to the booming retail industry. Like other cities its size, Manchester, Connecticut has its fair share of crime. However, adhering to basic safety rules, like locking up homes and avoiding being out alone at night, can protect one from becoming a victim. Yet in 1996, crime found its way to the doorstep of Gail Islieb and her husband, Doug. Gail Roberta Morse Islieb was born on October 6, 1941, to parents George and Methel Morse. She was raised in Rumford, Maine, along with her brother George Jr. and sisters Kathleen and Meredith. In 1961, at the age of 20, Gail married Clarence Schultz. They had three children together, a son named Chris and two daughters named Leanne and Merritt. In 1966, the entire family relocated to Connecticut, but soon afterwards, their marriage ended in divorce. Gail married a second time in 1973, but that union too was short-lived. Gail began working as an office manager at Styro Sales in 1985, and it was while working there that she met Doug Islieb. They married in 1992 and settled down in Manchester, Connecticut. Gail was a very well-loved person in their blended family. She was a devoted mother and grandmother, and everyone adored her loving and nurturing personality. Husband and wife who were just minding their business, uh, living their lives. Gail was a, a devoted mother, it's pretty obvious. She was a devoted grandmother. In 1995, she began working at the local Walmart as a sales assistant in the shoe department. Co-workers gravitated towards Gail's warm and easygoing nature. She was the type of person to offer a helping hand to anyone in need. She faced all challenges with a smile, never complaining about her own problems. But little did anyone know, Gail was fighting a private battle that was about to end in tragedy. It was a stormy night on Tuesday, April 30th, 1996, when the Walmart store manager told Gail and her co-workers they could finish up their shifts and leave at 10 p.m. She arrived home at around 10.50 p.m. Her husband, Doug, had just got up from the couch to open the front door when he heard a commotion outside as Gail pressed on the car horn several times. This was followed by multiple gunshots. Doug ran outside to make sure Gail was safe but stopped in his tracks when he saw a man standing with a gun near her car door. He immediately ran back inside and grabbed his own gun before making a call to the Manchester Emergency Services. He told the dispatcher that there was a robbery in progress and a masked man had shot at his wife. Manchester Emergency. There's a robbery here. I think somebody shot at my wife. I just saw somebody here with a mask. He remained on the line until officers from the Manchester Police Department arrived at the house. At the scene, Officers saw that Gail was still in the car with her left hand clutching at her left temple. The glass on the driver's side door was shattered and shards littered the ground and car interior. One of the officers reached into the car to check Gail's pulse, but her hand fell away lifelessly as her body slumped over the front passenger seat. The police knew immediately that Gail was dead. Crime scene technicians got to work after Gail's body was removed from the car and taken to the office of the medical examiner. Inside the car, they found seven spent shell casings, all belonging to a 22 caliber gun, 
the same caliber gun that her husband Doug was holding in his hand when police arrived. The initial autopsy report indicated that Gail had been shot at point-blank range, and five of the seven shots had been fired directly at her head. It was an up-close and personal attack, with signs of overkill. From experience, police knew that whomever had killed Gail knew her personally. All fingers now pointed at her husband, Doug. Well, uh, naturally, we have a shooting. He's at the scene with a gun. Well, you're gonna, that's gonna be the first place you're gonna, you know, consider something. Detective Paul Lombardo of the Manchester Police Department took the lead on the case. He split his team into two groups. One group set about questioning neighbors and other potential witnesses, while he and the other detectives took Doug into custody for questioning. Doug was taken to the police station and questioned about the events of the night. His gun was also confiscated and taken in for testing. When questioned, Doug repeated what he'd said to the dispatcher during the 911 call earlier. However, he then told detectives that he believed the gunman may have been a light-skinned Hispanic person. He thought that the subject that he saw in his driveway was a uh, Hispanic male, a uh, light-skinned male. Detectives immediately pointed out that on the call to the dispatcher, Doug had described the man as wearing a mask. They also told Doug that he'd reported the incident as a robbery in progress, but none of Gail's personal belongings had been taken from the car. For Lombardo and his team, Doug's story seemed suspicious. However, the team that was questioning neighbors reported their findings to Lombardo within the hour. Several neighbors corroborated Doug's story of hearing gunshots. They also told police that they'd seen a white sedan pull away from the Islib's driveway after the shooting. These eyewitness accounts were backed up by the ballistics report. Although Doug's gun was a 22 caliber revolver, it had not been fired recently and all the bullets were accounted for. Doug was cleared and allowed to go home. Lombardo and his team returned to the crime scene to look for other clues and determine a possible reason for the shooting. One of their theories was that Gail may have been the victim of a road rage incident. Gail could have unintentionally cut someone off while driving on the highway, and the person may have followed her home and confronted her in the driveway before shooting at her and fleeing. One of the things that we looked at was the possibility that maybe perhaps this was a road rage type of incident. Well, maybe she cut someone off on her way home and, you know, the person uh, you know, wound up driving and, and taking some shots at her. But the new theory didn't sit well with Detective Lombardo and his team. From the various statements given by neighbors and Gail's own family, she was not a confrontational person. Everyone agreed that Gail was friendly and the most unlikely person to make an enemy. It was while trying to reconstruct the type of person Gail was that Detective Lombardo began talking to her daughter, Leanne. Leanne told the detective that Gail had started to behave strangely in the last few months. There were two incidents that stood out to Leanne. The first was when her mother started to hang blankets over the windows in the house. And I said something to her about it. I said, Mom, what are you doing hanging blankets from the windows? And her response to me was, well, you never know who could be out there looking in your windows. The second was when Leanne wanted to use her mother's car to run a quick errand, but Gail had refused. She parked behind me and I said, Mom, where are your keys? And she refused to let me take her car. She's like, oh, no, 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 just, just move my car. Um, I don't have enough gas. And she made up one excuse after another. Although Gail had remained vague about what had triggered this change in her behavior, her children knew something was off. I think that she felt like she was protecting us by not exposing us to any danger that might be around. Lombardo sensed he needed to get to the bottom of Gail's sudden change in behavior. He decided to interview the people she worked with daily at the local Walmart. On the morning of Wednesday, May 1st, 1996, Detective Lombardo made his way to the Walmart where Gail worked. The store just opened for business, making it easier to interview her co-workers. They only had good things to say about Gail, but they also mentioned an interesting bit of information. According to Gail's co-workers, she'd been having problems with a fellow employee named Tyrone Montgomery. He was 25 years old and worked in the sporting goods department. Tyrone became good friends with Gail, but had soon started making advances towards her. Employees told Lombardo that Tyrone had become obsessed with Gail. I think some of the words that the employees used were that this person was infatuated with Mrs. Islieb and would, um, you know, just constantly be talking to her and harassing her. Gail had told him she was married, but he continued to pursue her despite her disinterest. On his days off, he'd come into the store and follow Gail around her department. He asked her out to dinner repeatedly, but she politely declined. Many saw him try to put his arm around her, 
but she kept pushing him away. Montgomery would come in on his days off and hang around the shoe department and follow Gail around uh, when Gail was working. It became obvious that he, he was um, drawn to her and uh, his feelings were unrequited. Gail was not confrontational and politely played off his advances. She did, however, tell her store manager about the issue, but nothing was ever done. Another co-worker told Lombardo of an eerie incident that happened a week before Gail's murder. Tyrone's car had a flat tire, so he asked another employee for a ride back to his house. It so happened that Gail was the person who offered him help. The next day, Gail had told the same co-worker that while dropping Tyrone off at his house, he pulled out a BB gun and pushed it against her ribs. He allegedly told Gail that it would be so easy to hijack her, but Gail never reported the incident to police or her family. He apparently either got a ride from her or gave her a ride somewhere, pulled out a, a BB gun and said, see how easy it would be to hijack you, and stuck the, the gun in her ribs, words to that effect. It was only the co-worker who knew what had happened. After he questioned the employees, Lombardo noticed the store had a gun department. He checked through the records to see if Tyrone had bought a gun from the store, but there was no record. However, Tyrone's actions were raising major red flags, and Lombardo knew it was time to question him. From employee records, detectives were able to get a hold of Tyrone's home address. However, when they arrived at his house on the afternoon of May 1st, 1996, he was nowhere to be found. What they did find was a white sedan parked in the garage. Upon speaking to Tyrone's stepfather, they discovered that the car belonged to him and Tyrone often borrowed it. Detectives explained to Tyrone's mother and stepfather about what had happened to Gail. They also told them that Tyrone was a person of interest in the investigation, but his parents had no idea where Tyrone was at that moment. The car was impounded while police worked to obtain a warrant to search the vehicle. On the morning of Thursday, May 2nd, 1996, investigators began to search the car for any clues that could lead to answers in Gail's murder. Inside, they found a knife, an ice pick, makeup, women's clothing, a cake dish, latex gloves, and duct tape. They also found handwritten notes in the car, one of which had been partially burned and left in the ashtray. Another note looked like a love letter written to Gail. To detectives, the burnt pages looked like a criminal checklist. The notes included directions on how to disguise oneself. It also mentioned coming up with an excuse of returning a cake dish in order to gain entry into Gail and Doug's home. But what confused detectives was the mention of using an ice pick on a man. They concluded that perhaps Doug was the intended victim after all. At this point, we had no way of talking to him about that. So we had to find other means of, of tying these notes into Tyrone. With no way to find Tyrone and question him, detectives decided to consult a handwriting expert to link Tyrone to the murder notes. Detectives sent the notes to the Connecticut Forensic Science Laboratory to be analyzed by forensic document examiner Jim Streeter. Streeter was able to positively match Tyrone's handwriting to the notes found in the car after analyzing his handwriting employment application from Walmart. There were numerous individual handwriting characteristics and, and habits that I observed. We had the use of almost a cursive J in this print style writing and often it almost resembled a letter L, a cursive letter L. That was one letter. There was a, a consistent use of an entry stroke appearing to the left of the perpendicular in a lowercase e that was consistent throughout the writings of both the question and the note. But there was another spark of hope for detectives. They received a tip-off from another employee at Walmart who said that Tyrone had called in sick to work the day after Gail's murder. According to the employee, Tyrone had checked himself into the psychiatric ward at Cedarcrest Hospital in Connecticut after exhibiting symptoms of depression following Gail's death. Apparently he had made the comment at the hospital that a friend of his had just died and he was feeling uh, suicidal. Detectives rushed to the hospital eager to speak with Tyrone, but hospital policy forbade them from speaking to a patient without consent. Hospital staff did confirm Tyrone had checked himself in after hearing about the death of a close friend. Detectives waited until Tyrone agreed to a brief interview. On the evening of May 2nd, 1996, detectives questioned Tyrone about Gail's murder. He denied responsibility for the murder and instead told police that his grief over her death was the reason he checked into the hospital. When asked about owning a gun, Tyrone admitted to buying a gun from the Walmart store where he worked. However, he'd sold the gun days before Gail's murder. He cut the interview short, claiming he felt too upset to talk about Gail, but detectives were one step ahead. 
They had a warrant to retrieve his clothes he was wearing when he checked into the hospital. There was one problem. The clothes the hospital collected had been washed. Any possible evidence had long been destroyed. Guess pursuant to hospital policy, they had laundered the clothing before it was handed over to the Manchester Police Department uh, via search warrant. However, there was still a ray of hope. Tyrone's boots had not been cleaned. Detectives sent the boots off to the forensic laboratory for testing. Embedded in the sole of the boot was a piece of glass. Detectives didn't want to raise their hopes yet, as the glass could have come from anywhere. Crime scene analyst Virginia Maxwell examined the glass fragment by studying its refractive index to measure how light passed through glass shards. After comparing both fragments on a light spectrum, Maxwell concluded that the glass found on Tyrone's boot matched the glass from Gail's car window. But when we do testing with refractive indices, the best we can say is that that known sample could have been the source of that question sample. But investigators needed more proof to tie Tyrone to Gail's murder. They needed to find the gun used to murder Gail. Detective Lombardo and his team were not willing to rest until they solved the case. On the morning of Friday, May 3rd, 1996, crime scene investigators and detectives searched Tyrone Montgomery's home. They looked for the weapon used in Gail's shooting, but had no luck finding it. What they did discover were several books on how to be a hitman and how to disguise oneself. We found some indications that he had purchased some books, uh, books on how to be a hitman. And what they were were these uh, books on, quote unquote, how to, how to commit a murder. We began to find parallels to what he had written in his notes, some of the things he had done uh, prior to the murder. In the basement, they found a makeshift shooting range. There was no gun in the basement either, but bullets were found in the walls and spent shell casings on the floor. The bullets were too damaged to be compared to the bullets recovered from the crime scene, but the casings were used to test against those found in Gail's car. Ballistics expert Edward Jakimowicz compared the casings from Tyrone's basement to those found at the crime scene. Under a microscope, Jakimowicz studied both casings and discovered distinct microscopic marks on the shells. He determined that the markings were caused by the gun being improperly assembled. A particular model of firearm was, was a takedown, meaning that you could break it into two pieces and transport it from one place to another. Uh, and it just wasn't quite together properly. Whoever assembled this just didn't push the frame back into the barrel tight enough. So there was about a millimeter gap between the frame and the barrel. In his findings, Giacomoitz concluded that the gun used to kill Gale was the same gun that was fired in Tyrone's basement. Detectives and prosecutors now felt confident that Tyrone was their suspect. The handwritten notes, glass fragments, and shell casings were enough evidence to tie him to Gale Islieb's murder. On Friday, May 3, 1996, Tyrone Montgomery was arrested and charged for the murder of Gale Islieb. Having gathered all the evidence, detectives sat down to question Tyrone. They interrogated him about the notes and the murder plot he developed. Tyrone admitted his intended target was Gail's husband, Doug. On the morning of April 30th, 1996, Tyrone had followed Doug to a tool and die plant. He planned to stab Doug when he exited his car, but it changed his mind as there were too many witnesses. When detectives presented their theory that he changed his plan and targeted Gail instead, Tyrone denied being responsible for the shooting. Although Tyrone refused to admit he killed Gail, the evidence spoke for itself. Tyrone was charged for Gail's murder on May 10, 1996. He was held at the Hartford Correctional Center on a bond of $1.5 million. Detectives still needed to find the weapon. They revisited the manager of the gun department at Walmart, armed with Tyrone's confession of the gun purchase. The manager confessed that, upon hearing about Gail's murder, he'd altered the logbooks to make the gun untraceable on their system. He then provided detectives with the original logbook entry and serial number. Detectives traced the gun to the new owner in Middleton, Connecticut on August 24, 1996. The gun was tested by the ballistics department. The results proved that it was the same weapon used to kill Gail and matched the shell casings found in Tyrone's basement. Looking at the side or the circumference surface of the cartridge case, yeah, the most obvious mark in, in this particular case was that accidental mark left by that firearm not being properly assembled. State prosecutor Dennis O'Connor was in charge of building the case against Tyrone Montgomery. It was his job to put forward a convincing argument as to why Tyrone was the person responsible for Gail Islieb's murder. Together with detectives, the prosecution team developed a working theory of what had led to the murder. They believed that Tyrone had become infatuated with Gail despite their age difference. 
he may have sought comfort in her company and attempted to pursue her aggressively. When she rejected his advances, he became frustrated. To him, the major problem was her marriage to Doug. Tyrone then concocted a plan to get rid of Doug so that he and Gail could be together. Tyrone began researching methods of murder and kidnapping. He developed several scenarios and made notes on how to carry out the crime. He stalked Gail and Doug, learning their daily routines and movements. He planned to attack Doug in the parking lot after following him to work, but backed out because it was busy. Tyrone then opted to go for the second scenario. This time, he intended to disguise himself as a woman and pretend to be returning a cake dish to gain entry into Gail and Doug's home. They believe he intended to kill Doug and kidnap Gail when she returned home that evening. However, his plan was foiled when Gail arrived home and saw him standing near the garage door. In a moment of panic, he decided to silence Gail after she started pressing on the car horn to alert Doug. Whichever way the prosecution looked at it, Tyrone had intended to murder someone that evening. Tyrone Montgomery went to trial in mid-September 1997. The prosecution led by Dennis O'Connor presented their theory to the jury. Over the course of two weeks, the jury heard testimony from witnesses who testified about Tyrone's behavior towards Gale and from experts in the field of forensic science. Tyrone's attorney, Stephen Cashman, argued that his client never confessed to killing Gale. But the jury had come to a decision. On October 1st, 1997, after just two hours of deliberation, Tyrone Montgomery was found guilty of the murder of Gail Islieb. His sentencing hearing was held on November 21st, 1997. Throughout his trial, he remained emotionless. However, after he was sentenced to 65 years in prison, he was given an opportunity to address the court. Tyrone then made an open threat to the investigation and prosecution team. And to everyone involved in this case against me, at some point, we will meet again. You will not stop a juggernaut. The apocalypse has spoken. In the year 2000, Tyrone appealed his conviction on the grounds that his car had been impounded and searched unlawfully. He argued that the evidence used by the prosecution was an infringement on his Fourth Amendment rights. The Supreme Court of Connecticut rejected his appeal and upheld the original verdict. Several years after his conviction, Tyrone reached out to Officer Jeff Lampson of the Manchester Police Department. During the phone call, Tyrone admitted to Officer Lampson that he was indeed guilty for Gail's murder. Tyrone has not reached out since. He remains incarcerated at the McDougal Walker Correctional Institute in Suffield, Connecticut, and is expected to be released in 2061 at age 90. Following Tyrone's sentencing and imprisonment, Gail's family spoke to the media about how the untimely loss of the beloved wife and mother had impacted their lives. You know, I'm really sorry that I couldn't help her with that um, and that she felt she had to deal with it on her own. Um, because I know if that was, was me, I would be terrified, terrified. Her son Chris and daughters Leanne and Merritt told reporters that their mother's efforts to keep them out of harm's way was ultimately what led to her death. I think that she felt like she was protecting us by not exposing us to any danger that might be around. In an interview, Chris said that his mother had underestimated Tyrone's capability of hurting her. In their own way, it was a message to other families to take notice of what their loved ones may be enduring and to be aware of the signs of harassment and stalking. Gail's husband, Doug, continued to live in the home that they shared. It was his way of keeping the memory of Gail alive. Doug also granted interviews with newspapers and voiced his regret about not noticing something was wrong sooner. He recalled incidents when the security light would turn on randomly and their dogs would bark without being provoked. It was only in hindsight that he realized Tyrone may have been stalking them months before Gail was murdered. He said that Gail had often spoken kindly about Tyrone as a hardworking kid who was trying to make it on his own. Doug believed that Gail's nurturing and motherly personality was what attracted Tyrone to her in the first place. After the investigation, Gail's family filed two lawsuits against Walmart for being negligent in preventing her murder. The first lawsuit was filed against the management team for failing to recognize the danger that Tyrone posed to Gail despite the complaints she'd made. The second lawsuit was about the store's failure to promptly log the sale of the gun bought by Tyrone Montgomery. What became of the lawsuits remains unknown as there have not been any further reports on the case. Gail Islieb's murder ranks among the most tragic cases covered by our channel. 
It's sad to think that she was a woman who often tried to overlook people's faults and find the goodness in them. It was this very comforting nature of hers that ultimately led to her death. I don't have a body. I don't have anything to tell me what happened to my son. Supposedly, alligators ate him. After 31-year-old Jerry Michael Williams failed to return from a duck hunting trip to Lake Seminole, Florida in December 16, 2000, his family knew something was wrong. Worried about his safety, they set out to search for him, but it was as if he'd vanished without a trace. After several months of searching, Mike was declared legally dead. However, the story of his disappearance did not end there. Over the next 18 years, investigators revisited the case and developed various theories, but found nothing that added up. It wasn't until an unrelated incident uncovered a web of deceit and opened up a closet full of skeletons. But what really happened to Mike? Did he disappear voluntarily or meet a tragic end? We return once again to the sunshine state of Florida and the city of Tallahassee. With a population of just over 196,000 residents, Tallahassee is the eighth largest city in the state of Florida. It's known as a good place to live for those wanting to raise a family, with its cost of living ranking at 4% lower than the national average in the United States. Its beautiful natural environment, historic spaces, and bustling urban areas make it a cultural melting pot and offers everyone their own unique experience. However, on the downside, Tallahassee has one of the highest crime rates in the state, with it being safer than only 10% of other cities in Florida. In the year 2000, Michael and Denise Williams called Tallahassee, Florida home. First though, let's return to Mike's humble beginnings. Jerry Michael Williams was born on October 16, 1969 in Bradfordville, north of Tallahassee. He was popularly known as Mike. His father was a Greyhound bus driver and his mother Cheryl operated a children's daycare from their mobile home. He had an older brother named Nick. People often referred to Mike as being humble, generous, and dependable. His parents decided against building a new house and used the money to provide both Mike and Nick with a quality education. Mike and Nick started working part-time at local supermarkets from their early teens to help their parents pay for their education. They both attended the North Florida Christian High School. Mike excelled in both academics and sport. He played football and was the student council president. Mike also developed an interest in duck hunting at the age of 15 a hobby he shared with his father. While at school, he met Denise Merrill, a cheerleader and fellow student council member. Through Denise, he became close friends with Brian Winchester and his girlfriend, Kathy Thomas. Both couples remained close friends even after graduating high school in 1988. Mike went on to study political science and urban planning at Florida State University. Before graduating, he was hired by the Ketchum Appraisal Group as a property appraiser. The company owner called Mike the hardest working man he'd ever met. On December 16, 1994, he married Denise. The same year, Brian also married Kathy. Both couples remained close friends. Mike and Denise eventually moved into an upscale but small suburb on the east side of Tallahassee. On May 8, 1999, Mike and Denise welcomed a baby girl named Ansley into the world. Mike was as devoted to his family as he was to his job. I was totally overwhelmed. She was due Tuesday, and she would have made me wait a whole other year for Mother's Day, so she came yesterday so I could enjoy this day today with her. It was unbelievable. I have a whole new respect for my wife and women in general and what they go through to bring a, a new child, new life into the world. After his father passed away suddenly in the year 2000, Mike saw the need to ensure his family was provided for financially. He took out a life insurance policy valued at $1 million with his friend Brian. Mike was looking forward to expanding his family with Denise and celebrating their sixth wedding anniversary on December 16, 2000. They'd also planned a family cruise to Hawaii in a few months. Little did Mike or anyone else know what was about to unfold. As dawn broke on the Saturday morning of December 16, 2000, Mike woke up early to prepare himself for a relaxing day of duck hunting. He was looking forward to returning home later to celebrate his sixth wedding anniversary with his wife Denise and daughter Ansley in the city of Apalachicola, just an hour and a half away from Tallahassee. He attached his boat to his 1994 Ford Bronco truck, packed his gear and some food, and headed towards Lake Seminole, located on the border of Florida and Georgia. By midday, however, Mike had not returned home. Denise tried calling his phone several times, but each call went to voicemail. It was unusual behavior for Mike, as he was always available to take a call from his wife in case of an emergency. Denise was also concerned because she and Mike had made plans to spend their anniversary together. 
She called her father and told him that Mike had not returned from duck hunting. Denise then called Brian Winchester, Mike's best friend. Denise asked him if he could help find Mike, who she believed was missing. Brian and his father Marcus decided to drive down to the lake and search for Mike in the areas he frequented. After a long search of Mike's favorite hunting spots, they found his Ford truck parked near a remote boat launch at a cove on the Florida side of Lake Seminole. There was no sign of Mike or his boat. Brian decided it was time to call the authorities. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission handled the search as it was reported as a missing hunter case. Their focus was a search and rescue operation. The search focused on the 10 acres of the lake surrounding the cove where Mike's truck was found. Officers from the FFWCC used air and land support in their search. A team of divers carefully navigated the area due to the alligators living in the lake. It was a few hours later a pilot discovered Mike's boat in the water. It had drifted just 225 feet away from the boat ramp. Upon searching the boat, they found Mike's shotgun still in its case. But there was no sign of Mike. Divers, too, had no luck in finding any trace of Mike in the search area. Deputies from the Jackson County Sheriff's Office also joined the search as additional manpower was needed. From what investigators discovered at the scene, there were no signs that suggested foul play. Unfortunately, that night, a storm rolled in, bringing with it a cold front that delayed the search for Mike. At the time, investigators believed that Mike had been the victim of a boating accident. They theorized that Mike's boat could possibly have hit one of the many protruding tree stumps in the lake, causing him to fall over and drown. Having found none of his hunting gear on the boat, they concluded that he was wearing his hunting gear at the time of the accident. It was a strong possibility his gear may have filled with water and dragged him to the bottom of the lake. Furthermore, investigators determined that Mike may have been attacked and dismembered by the alligators that populated the lake. Investigators explained this theory to Mike's family, but his mother, Cheryl, refused to believe it. I don't have a body. I don't have anything to tell me what happened to my son. Supposedly, alligators ate him. As the search resumed, Cheryl herself hired a private search team to help locate Mike. If Mike had drowned and then been attacked by alligators, investigators were sure his body would eventually float to the surface of the lake. Days turned to weeks, and weeks turned to months. By February 2001, the search had come to a standstill. There was no sign of Mike. The private search team now also agreed with the theory that Mike may have been eaten by alligators. The only possible explanation for a lack of a body was that the alligators could have stored the remains in a location that search teams couldn't locate. A day after the search was called off, Denise held a memorial service for Mike. To everyone, it had seemed that Denise had come to terms with losing Mike but Cheryl refused to keep quiet. She continued to try to reignite search efforts to find Mike, but the investigators firmly believed that Mike had met a tragic end on Lake Seminole. In June 2001, a curious discovery was made by an angler fishing in Lake Seminole. While out on the lake, he discovered a pair of waders floating in the water. He contacted the FFWCC and a renewed search began. It was the first big break since Mike had gone missing six months earlier. Divers who were called to help in the search found a lightweight hunting jacket at the bottom of the lake. After bringing it to the surface, they discovered a fully functioning flashlight and a hunting license belonging to Mike Williams. The find, however, raised more questions. There were no visible teeth marks on the hunting jacket or the waders to suggest an attack by alligators. The condition of the jacket, flashlight, and hunting license were not consistent with being in the water for an extended period of time. The jacket was tested for DNA that would have been left behind had Mike been using the gear, but all tests came back negative. But the discovery was not the only surprising news Cheryl and her son Nick were about to receive. A week after Mike's hunting jacket was found in the lake, a Leon County judge granted Mike's widow Denise a petition to have him declared legally dead. A process that normally took five years in the state of California was granted in a matter of six months. The decision allowed Denise to begin proceedings to access Mike's life insurance. She was able to cash out three life policies with an accumulated value of $1.5 million. Denise, it seemed, had moved on and refused to search for Mike or seek any further assistance. The entire situation seemed suspicious to Cheryl, who believed there was something more to the case. She had not been made aware that Denise had petitioned for Mike to be declared legally dead. She vowed not to give up her fight for justice. After trying and failing to have the investigation into Mike's disappearance reopened, his mother Cheryl took the matter into her own hands again. She strongly believed that Mike had not drowned in the lake. As far as she knew, Mike had been highly experienced in duck hunting and took all the precautions he needed before setting out on a trip. 
Cheryl turned to taking out advertisements in the local newspapers, granting local reporters interviews, and going as far as to put up billboards seeking answers about Mike. Having lost her husband and now her son, it had been too hard for her to process that Mike simply vanished. She'd kept notes on Mike's investigation and even made her own investigation into the alligator theory. This, however, created tension between her and Denise. Following Mike's death, Denise had remained on good terms with Cheryl. But as time passed and Cheryl remained relentless in her search for Mike, Denise grew angry. She issued Cheryl and Mike's brother Nick with an ultimatum to stop the investigation or they would never see Ansley again. According to reports, an article in the Tallahassee Democrat led to a confrontation between Denise, Cheryl, and Nick in August 2001. Denise had called Cheryl and Nick over to the home she once shared with Mike. The talk turned into a heated confrontation between Denise and Cheryl, with Denise accusing her mother-in-law of being stubborn. Denise added that she was tired of seeing articles about Mike and his disappearance in the paper and on billboards in the city. She just wanted to have a chance to get on with her life. Cheryl faced the possibility of losing contact with her granddaughter Ansley, but she could not give up on her son. After Mike disappeared, she threatened me. She said, if you do anything to get a criminal investigation, you're going to lose access to Ansley, my granddaughter. I'd already lost my husband. I lost Michael. And now she's telling me I'm going to lose Ansley. Mike's case was reopened in 2004 after Cheryl lobbied for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement to take a fresh look at the evidence they initially collected. Over the course of four years, Cheryl remained active in the investigation and took her evidence to the department. One of the theories she helped dispel was that of the alligators devouring Mike's remains. Through independent research and seeking out an expert, Cheryl was able to learn that alligators do not feed during the cold winter months. This evidence was brought to the department officials who conducted their own investigation into alligator feeding habits. It was proven correct, and the initial belief that Mike was eaten by alligators was debunked by several experts. Some went as far as to explain that it would be a stretch to imagine a fully grown adult male being completely devoured by alligators. Other officers who had been part of the initial investigation came forward with some of the inconsistencies they discovered during the case. The first issue began with the discovery of Mike's truck and boat. Everyone who knew Mike understood that he was a stickler when it came to safety. Mike knew the area well enough to understand the dangers of parking his truck and launching his fishing boat in an isolated and underdeveloped area. He was not the type of person to take a risk like that. He often used the concrete boat launches when fishing. Another peculiarity was with the boat itself. For one, the engine had been switched off and the gas tank was still full. If Mike fell off the boat while hunting, the engine would still have been switched on but dead and the gas tank completely empty. The final puzzling factor was the discovery of the waders and hunting jacket. There had been no signs of damage by wildlife, nor was there any significant water damage related to being submerged in fresh water for an extended period. There were only two possible theories investigators could come up with. Either Mike had left on his own, or foul play was involved in his disappearance. Questions were being raised, and Mike's case had come into the spotlight once again. Although Cheryl finally received the breakthrough she'd been fighting for, she was about to be dealt another blow. In January 2005, things reached a tipping point between Denise and Cheryl. Following the reopening of the case, Denise denied Cheryl and Nick any access to Ansley. But investigators' suspicions were raised even further after the marriage of Denise Williams to Brian Winchester on December 3, 2005. Investigators learned that two years after Mike's disappearance, Brian filed for divorce from his wife Kathy and moved in with Denise. They interviewed Kathy, who told them that she suspected Brian was having an affair with Denise since 1997. Furthermore, Brian was the person who drew up Mike's insurance policy just six months before his disappearance. The same policies that Denise cashed mere days after her petition to have Mike declared legally dead was allowed. Brian also seemed to integrate himself into the investigation at rather crucial moments. He was the person to find Mike's truck, he agreed with the alligator theory, and he helped identify the items found in the lake six months after Mike disappeared. Investigators also learned of the confrontations between Denise and Cheryl. It seemed odd to them that, as Mike's wife, she did not want anything more to do with the investigation and also tried to deter Cheryl from pursuing the case. This prompted investigators to bring both Brian and Denise in for questioning in 2005. When questioned about the day of Mike's disappearance, Brian told investigators he'd planned to go hunting with his father-in-law on the morning of December 16, 2000. However, he overslept after attending a concert with his ex-wife Kathy the night before. His story seemed to fit with a background investigation into his movements on the day of Mike's disappearance. During her questioning, 
Denise described her day in a matter-of-fact style. She said that she woke up after Mike left to go hunting. She then tended to Ansley and went about her daily routine. Later, she called to check on Mike, and after several unanswered calls, decided to contact her father and Brian to help look for Mike. Her answers were cool and without emotion, according to investigators. But the interviews did not bring investigators any closer to discovering what happened to Mike. In 2008, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement announced that Mike's disappearance was not an accident, and they believed that foul play was involved. However, without enough evidence, they were unable to issue any search warrants or pursue charges in the case. This was impacted by the fact that the initial investigation had not focused on the homicide angle at all. Due to this, all possible evidence from the crime scene, Mike's boat and truck, had deteriorated. They actively stopped pursuing the case, but investigators remained hopeful that sometime in the future, a spilled secret could lead to the truth behind Mike's disappearance. Cheryl continued to put pressure on the FDLE to look into Mike's case. When her attempts failed, she turned to writing a letter every single day for nine years to the office of the governor of Florida. After sending nearly 2,600 letters to the office without reply, she called the office of Governor Rick Scott personally to ask why he didn't answer any of her letters. Cheryl was told that all of her letters had been forwarded to the FDLE for further investigation. Disappointed but not deterred, Cheryl continued to seek justice. On her own, she held a demonstration in Tallahassee in 2011 to honor Mike and seek answers in his case. On the afternoon of August 5, 2016, the course of the investigation finally took a turn for the better. In a surprising twist of events, Denise walked into the Leon County Sheriff's Office to file a charge of kidnapping and request a protection order against her ex-husband, Brian Winchester. This was, however, part of the investigative team's plan over the last few years. Unbeknownst to Denise O'Brien, investigators have been watching them closely over the years. They were aware that the couple separated in 2012 after Brian proved to be unfaithful in the marriage. Added to that was the tension created by the investigation into Mike's case as a possible homicide and their constant fighting. Investigators were aware that both Brian and Denise had started to grow paranoid since their previous interview with the couple. Those monitoring the couple noticed that Denise maintained her cool exterior and didn't seem to fold under pressure. Brian, however, had started to unravel under the weight of the stress. According to a few friends of Brian, he'd become a ghost of his former self. He was desperate to hold on to his marriage with Denise. Brian turned to therapy for treatment of his addictions. Denise, however, went ahead and filed for divorce from Brian in 2015. This had been the tipping point. According to reports, investigators saw an opportunity to strike while the iron was hot. The investigators knew they needed to provoke a reaction from either Denise or Brian in order to get answers about what happened to Mike. They saw their opportunity on the evening of August 4, 2016. Investigators paid Brian a visit knowing that he was the weak link. They explained to him that Denise planned to tell them the truth about Mike's disappearance once her divorce with him was made official. With no spousal privilege binding them, she could testify and place the blame of Mike's disappearance squarely on his shoulders. The investigators' ploy paid off, and they finally had Denise where they wanted her, in the interrogation room. Over the course of three hours, Denise explained her side of the story and how Brian had attempted to kidnap her on the morning of August 5, 2016, the day after the investigators had approached Brian. On that morning, Denise was on her way to work at Florida State University when she noticed a man climbing over the back seat of her SUV. She then noticed that it was Brian. She explained to officers that she believed Brian may have been sleeping in her car, lying in wait for her. She believed that he'd resorted to this after she refused to answer any of his numerous phone calls the night before. Denise went on to explain that Brian got into the seat behind her and held a handgun to her ribs. Brian then demanded she drive to an isolated area, but she didn't comply. Instead, she intentionally made a wrong turn that led to a parking lot of a local drugstore. Denise explained she was in tears at the time due to the shock of the situation, but Brian was furious and screamed at her to stop crying. She regained her composure and calmly asked him if he was planning on killing the both of them that day. Brian responded by saying he intended to take his own life because he had nothing more to live for after their divorce became final. In order to calm him down, she tried to soothe him and listen to his side of the story. Thereafter, she agreed not to report the incident to police and promised to meet with him and his father Marcus for a meeting that afternoon at Marcus's office. Once he calmed down, Denise drove him to his own truck. As he got ready to leave the car, he pulled out a backpack and began packing what appeared to be a sheet, a plastic cover, a metal tool, and a bottle of bleach. He also packed a gun into his bag. Denise realized that it was Brian's kill kit 
and if things had gone any other way, she would not have been here at the sheriff's office reporting the incident. Her first instinct after Brian drove off was to get a protection order for herself and Ansley. Officers were able to gain Denise's trust by agreeing with her assessment of Brian's behavior and gradual loss of control. Sheriff's deputies contacted FDLE Special Agent Mike Devaney and Tallahassee Police Officer David McCrane, both of whom worked on Mike's case. McCrane also happened to be Denise's brother-in-law, as he was her sister Deborah's husband. They gained her confidence by talking about Brian's kidnapping attempt before jumping straight into the real reason they were there, to get answers about Mike's disappearance. McCrane presented Denise with what they knew about Brian's behavior before throwing out the idea that if Brian could attempt killing her, it was possible he also killed Mike. I'm wondering if she was taking it to the same place today that he buried Mike, because he's done it before. You have to wrap your mind around it, Denise. That is what he has done, and he's willing to do it again. He is going to kill you. Think about it. He went through, he slept in your car and waited for you. But I don't think he slept. I think he knew what time he was watching you. That's just not to be he watched Mike. I watched Mike stay in that office every night till 11 o'clock at night, all the time. Mike was so predictable. I ever, every now and then I'd talk to him, but then I wouldn't get to talk to him. So predictable. Yeah. He waited for him that day. Was it? He was missing for five or six hours, Brian, the day of? I don't know. Well, a lot of people know. Missing? Yeah. Denise stubbornly refused to believe Brian was capable of such a horrific crime. McCrane reminded Denise of an incident with Brian and an ex-boyfriend in Atlanta from 2003, but Denise still refused to believe that Brian could have been a killer. Denise denied having any knowledge of Mike's disappearance. It was then the turn of Officer Devaney. He cut through her explanation of the kidnapping that occurred earlier that day and went straight to the point of Mike's disappearance. Denise remained steadfast and denied any knowledge of Mike's whereabouts. When he told her they had video evidence linking her to Mike's disappearance and a subsequent cover-up, she told him that she was starting to feel uncomfortable, and the interview with Devaney was concluded. If I say we're totally aware of all the, vi the videos, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you say what? The videos. I would have to see them. Probably well, that's not going to happen. But you, okay. you're clueless when I say videos. I don't... Yeah. You, you, Kathy and Brian? I would have to see them. Yeah. You're, you have no idea what I'm talking about. You don't say you just got to see it. No, I'm just, I'm just starting to feel very uncomfortable. Okay. Brian was eventually found and arrested on charges of attempted kidnapping, domestic assault, and armed burglary. At Brian's arraignment, Denise read a statement that begged for the judge to deny him bond for both her and her daughter's safety. She told the judge that she couldn't sleep because all she could feel was the gun pushing into her ribs and hearing Brian's threatening to end his life. Brian was held without bond. On December 19, 2017, Brian's sentencing hearing was held. He pleaded no contest to all charges leveled against him. Prosecutors asked that Brian receive a 45-year sentence because he was capable of repeating the crime for which he'd been charged. Denise again read a statement at Brian's hearing and pleaded with the judge to consider giving him a life sentence. She believed he was capable of finishing what he started if he was released early. He will finish what he has started. I'm asking you to sentence him to life in prison for the crimes he has committed. It comes down to my life or his, and I'm asking you, please, to choose mine. Thank you. Brian's defense argued that he should receive the 10-year minimum sentence, as on the day of the kidnapping, he'd suffered through great emotional stress. Upon learning of his mother's cancer diagnosis, the impending divorce from Denise, and the loss of custody of his son to his ex-wife Kathy, he lost control. Brian, too, read a statement in which he stated that he didn't intend to harm Denise, but knew that the incident hurt her deeply. He expressed his remorse openly. Did I have any intentions of harming Denise? Nor would I. Nonetheless, I do know that she was hurt by my actions, and again, I am truly sorry. Upon hearing all sides, the judge sentenced Brian to 20 years in prison at the Wakula Correctional Facility near Tallahassee, and another 15 years of probation. Mike's family, especially his mother Cheryl and brother Nick, were devastated with the outcome. Not once had Mike been mentioned during the case, nor was Brian's involvement highlighted in his disappearance. Mike's family and friends were left defeated by the sentencing. But the story of Mike was not about to be forgotten. 
In an unexpected twist, Special Agent Mark Perez of the FDLE made a startling announcement a day after Brian's sentencing. On December 20th, 2017, the investigators announced that Mike's remains had been found. This was confirmed through DNA testing later that week. His remains were discovered at the dead end of Gardner Road in Leon County, just five miles from where he grew up. Investigators did not reveal the manner in which Mike had met his tragic end, but confirmed that the case was being investigated as a homicide. Investigators continued to monitor Denise and brought Kathy Thomas, Brian's ex-wife, on board as an informant. Denise made contact with Kathy just a week after Brian's sentencing. Kathy played along as their conversations were being taped. Denise had wanted Kathy to pass along a message to Marcus, Brian's father. The message was to let Brian know she was not going to talk. Kathy tried several times to get Denise to talk, going as far as to lie about being called to testify about Brian's affair with Denise. She then dropped a bombshell. Kathy told Denise she knew about the plan that she and Brian hatched to have Mike murdered. Kathy explained that Brian lost his temper once and told her everything about the murder. Investigators analyzed the call and came to the conclusion that at no point did Denise deny having any part in Mike's disappearance. All Denise seemed concerned about was how much Brian had told Kathy. For investigators, the taped conversations were just the extra evidence they needed to put together an arrest warrant for Denise. They had already come to a plea agreement in October 2017 with Brian after his arrest for the attempted kidnapping of Denise. Brian did not hold back and agreed to turn witness in the case against Denise. He revealed to investigators the entire affair and detailed his and Denise's plan to have Mike murdered so that they could be together. Brian provided a curious detail of how they came up with a hunting trip as an alibi for the murder. He explained to investigators that on a previous hunting trip, Mike almost died after slipping into quicksand. Had Brian not been there, it was possible Mike would have perished. He explained to investigators how Denise thought that the hunting trip idea was a perfect cover-up. She believed that if God willed it, Mike would survive the planned accident. If not, then it was his destiny. Denise also didn't want to fight for custody over Ansley and was in a hurry to have Mike's life ended because she didn't want her daughter growing up with memories of Mike. On May 8, 2018, while leaving work to go home and celebrate her daughter Ansley's 19th birthday, Denise was arrested. She was charged for first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory after the fact. She was detained at the Leon County Detention Center, awaiting a bond hearing. In June 2018, she was denied bail and remained in the detention center until her trial began in December 2018. Denise's defense lawyer, Ethan Way, continued to appeal the charges and maintained Denise's not guilty plea. On December 11, 2018, Denise's trial began. Opening statements were heard on that day, and the prosecution argued that Denise preferred to be known as a widow rather than a divorcee. The next person to testify in the case was Brian Winchester. He told the court of their affair and how the plan to have Mike killed and make it look like an accident came about. And another option was that uh, the four of us would go out on a boat out into the Gulf and basically uh, that Kathy and Mike would be pushed over board and that Denise and I would find a buoy way offshore that we could uh, hold on to and either let the boat sink or let the boat take off on its own or whatever and make it look like we had an accident on the water uh, and that Denise and I had survived the accident. Throughout the trial, Denise remained emotionless, listening as witness after witness came forward exposing what they knew about her involvement in Mike's disappearance. During a cross-examination, Brian admitted that he was a liar and a murderer, but explained that his attorneys advised him to tell the truth and receive a deal for giving testimony of Denise's involvement in Mike's disappearance and murder. In the end, her defense team argued that there was no evidence tying Denise to Mike's disappearance, nor was there a confession from Denise that she played a role in Mike's murder. They went after Brian instead and pointed out the deal he made and the motivation he had to murder Mike. On December 14, 2018, the jury found Denise guilty on all charges after deliberating for eight hours. In February 2019, Denise was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Florida Women's Reception Center. The only person to speak at the sentencing apart from the lawyers was Cheryl Williams, who told the court that justice had finally been served. Judge Hankinson, there is no amount of prison time that will bring Mike back to me. I don't know if I will ever have Ansley in my life again because of the damage her mother has done. I am asking you to lock Denise Merrill Williams Winchester up 
for the rest of her life with no chance of parole. She has already lived 18 years longer than my son. Five months later, in July 2019, Ansley was awarded all the assets of her late father's estate and the insurance money received by Denise. She was awarded this with a caveat that she could in no way use the money to help pay for her mother's legal fees or else she would face a hefty penalty. In January 2020, Denise appealed her life sentence conviction before the Florida First District Court of Appeals. Her lawyers argued there was no evidence linking her to the actual crime. In November 2020, her murder conviction was overturned, but the conspiracy charge remained in place. Denise Williams' release date is set for April 25, 2047. She will be 78 years old before she sees the outside world again. Brian was moved to the Madison Correctional Institute in Florida to serve out the remainder of his sentence. His current release date is set for July 30, 2036, when he'll be 67 years old. Mike and Denise's daughter, Ansley, has maintained her mother's innocent and placed the blame on Brian Winchester. She refused to speak with any media outlets regarding the outcome of the case and her personal life. According to reports, Cheryl and Nick Williams have also had no luck in making contact with Ansley. Cheryl maintains there is so much she wants to tell Ansley, but most of all, she wanted her to know that her father Mike loved her dearly. For Cheryl, it's been hard knowing not only did she lose her son, she also lost her granddaughter. The case of Mike Williams is as sad as it is twisted. Not only did a good man lose his life, but for years, those responsible continued to benefit from measures he took to ensure his family's future. Do you believe that Brian only dragged Denise into the conspiracy out of revenge? Or is Denise equally guilty for Mike's murder, even if she didn't pull the trigger? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. If you have any cases you'd like us to cover, please mention that too in the comments as well. Also, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more mysterious crime content. Until next time, stay safe.